The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this light go. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. It is time to keep your appointment. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Horde Hill, episode 145. That's correct. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I looked at you then as I slowly ended the numbers. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Uh, well, we should do. After 10 years of recording, you should yes. uh, you should know this. Uh, speaking of which, next episode will be our special funky 10-year anniversary. Uh, my name is Kev. My name is Dan. Uh, if you're first-time listeners, we uh, like to talk about uh, horror movies, genre movies, science fiction movies, sometimes actiony, sometimes funny. Um, sometimes sexy and always dark generally dark yeah they, uh, most of them do have a dark themed uh, some patron picks sometimes might not do but uh, generally yes that is us yes. um, you're Dan and um, yeah <laughs> welcome everybody welcome to episode 145 yeah it's a, a festively Christmassy sort of time, isn't it? It's wintry time, and yes. I'm stamping this episode in any way, but it is getting around to that sort of time. So uh, it is. It everyone's is. keeping warm. Santa will be approaching soon, and uh, our next episode will be our Christmas episode, which is very exciting. As Gav mentioned, that will be our 10 year anniversary. So just to remind you, um, if you want to send us any sort of messages or anything to read out, pants or any kind of congratulations, don't send us pants. Send those to Gav. PO um, box. PO box. One, we haven't two, got one. We should, we should really get a podcast on a whole hill PO box and see what people send us. Well, I just give people my own address and they send me things. Like Matthew Godley, one of our patrons, who sends me DVDs. I need post. to give out my address then. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Matthew, thank you for The Woman in Black, the original. Um, it was awesome to watch that. I hadn't seen it for a very long time. Thank you. And I actually think I might prefer it to the remake, although the remake is very good with Daniel Daniel Harry Potter Radcliffe. We did do uh, uh, one part, once upon a time, we did do a competition that gave out some DVDs, didn't we? we did, it didn't yes. go that well. Uh, Andy won. Or yeah, if I remember. One of our friends. Yeah, yes. Which is good, because that helped the postage. Cause you I just, just walked around to him and said, here you go. Yeah, I think it goes well as what we wanted, because not many people uh, participate. So. Well, I hope it's all right, though. Um, mm. But yeah, we did do that once upon a time. Well, this episode, you already know what it is if you've clicked on it, because you've seen the thumbnail, you've seen the heading, the description. But we are doing a couple of horror anthologies. Yeah. Uh, so we will be covering The Twilight Zone, um, from the Twilight Zone movie from 1983, not the Twilight Zone, because that's probably about a hundred odd episodes of TV shows. We won't be covering that in this episode. We're just covering the movie from 1983. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to talk about with that film, and we'll get into that. I'm sure a lot of you know the stuff that's went on behind the scenes with that, um, including an actor and some children's deaths. Um, probably a little trigger warning really there are going to be some bits and bobs discussed that we are going to be discussing from injury so to children yeah, threat to yeah. children and stuff yeah so to just, children. just be careful mm. um skip forward if you do want but we'll let you know again when we're about to do that and we're also going to be covering uh, and some great directors by the way on the twilight zone so we'll get into that and we're also covering a stephen king novel turned into a horror anthology called cat's eye starring <clears throat> starring a very young drew barrymore as well as um, James, what's his face? What's his name? James Woods. Um, and a few other people in it as well. So we're covering a, a couple of horror anthologies for this episode. Bill Murray is on his way here in an Uber to help us with World of the Strange. Um, it's weird just thinking, I mean, it's Drew Barrymore. I was just thinking, well, if we put Michael in it, I, I drew Michael Barrymore. And just draw, I had a picture on the paper of Michael Barrymore. Weird. That's My weird. mind... It's weird. <clears throat> Should probably let our listeners know if this is your first time, there are going to be a lot of tangents in this one, okay? A lot of tangents. There always are. 
So just to let you know, that's where we're at. But before we begin our, our film reviews, we always like to have a catch up, talk about what we've been watching, what we've been up to. Um, my house has been a house full of illness. Um, that's why this episode is a little re- late. Um, I was the only person in my household that didn't have something. My son had a green hand because he is two and got a cut on it, which he then picked and then got, it got infected. Um, my daughter had quite a bad cough, which kept her up all night long and my wife then developed acute tonsillitis so that was a lot of fun but they are all better now and hopefully in the run-up to christmas we all remain fit and healthy just get a little uh like fake poster movie poster house of a thousand illnesses have you guys honestly that's us um but yeah so i haven't really been up to an awful lot really but um what about you gab is there anything you've been up to um uh just a normal a bit of working a bit of djing here and there for a bit of work as well as a normal sort of work um last night i watched a film heat which uh, i'm gonna recommend if you've not seen it <clears throat> it's a crime caper which i saw in the cinema but couldn't remember because i didn't appreciate it at the time i watched it as a teenager in 96 or whatever it was. i wouldn't have enjoyed it in the cinema at that no. late especially in 96 when i was a teenager yeah. uh, no i was kind of i didn't even know what i was watching so I was like, let's go to cinema and, and I, uh, I watched it last night really enjoyed it i like i like the uh so the sound design uh, just the live recording of the actual bullets and stuff on set going off and you can really hear it and just a really good film and a uh, 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 probably a, up there the best crime bank heist <coughs> caper type films going Mike, Michael Mann Michael Mann and yeah. I really love the fact you've got Al Pacino and his team of like detectives after Robert oh. De Niro oh oh. I still want him to cover Buster Rhymes <laughs> Oh, we gotta catch. Oh, okay, we're gonna catch. Oh yeah, we're gonna catch uh, Robert. This, the, this is a bit in the movie where he's talking to Hank Kazaria. Uh, Hank Kazaria, yeah. yeah. And he goes, "She's got a big ass," and he really like <laughs> eyes go big. And uh, he said that uh, that was like not scripted, and it actually scared him. And you could see because you see his reaction. It's a, that's not an acting act. That's a human being going. The fuck is he doing? <laughs> the thing about um, Al Pacino is he sounds like a man who still does a lot of cocaine, but I believe he's been he hasn't touched cocaine for a very know. long time. I don't know. In, in in heat, I don't know some of his things. And uh, she's got big ass. And you've the got funny your thing is, right people, up it. People always compare him and De Niro because they're Italian American actors and they're in a lot of gangster films. And obviously, they only were in a couple of movies together, really. And they're even in Heat, they're only in one scene, if I remember rightly, together. But they're very opposite ends of the scale because Al Pacino's at one end shouting and blustering, and then at the other end, you've got very scary, quiet. Mm. Okay, yeah, right, that's fine. Okay, really, I sounded a bit more like um, Denzel Washington then. So, you do what you do, take out bad guys like me, I do what I do, and it's real quiet against Al Pacino. But that scene when they're in the and uh, in the cafe, that was uh, that's no rehearsal. No, that that take was them sitting down for the first time ever together and getting two cameras going, let's just have this. And they both had the dialogue down that much. That that good, they that just good. that is the when you see that, that's like that's an acting class right there. Yeah, those guys are good, man, at what they do. Pacino is up there. You know, he's one of the best of all time, in my opinion. De Niro is good, but I always prefer Pacino because he's he's got that edge. You don't know when he's going to explode. You know. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, you got you got to see it. And so yeah, it's uh, Pacino and his team after De Niro and his team. So it's, wow, it's really quite a good movie. So it's that time of year at Christmas where you can sort of watch epic films. And I'd put this up there with like Once Upon a Time in the West or stuff like that as like a an epic movie that if you're going to sit down and go, I want to watch a three hour movie and it's a crime caper, check out Heist. It, uh, Heist. Check out Heat. Um, it's on every platform streaming, and I had it on Blu-ray. I got a Blu-ray out. The PlayStation was in the living room, so I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna have to go hook that up." And I was like, "It's on Amazon, Netflix, and Disney." And I was like, "Oh, nice. Choose one, you know." Uh, but recommend uh, if you're into crime capers and epic ones of that. Nice. Um, I've got a don't recommend. You know, you know, I love a shit film. Oh, I watched a really shit movie. I'll have to find out what that name is. Carry on talking. 
You know I love a shit film, and I love I love me a Christmas film, there's Christmas a lot horror sh- film. There's a lot of shit films out there at the moment. And I watch, and I love a werewolf film. So when I saw that Shudder, the Prime Horror Channel, had a film called Werewolf Santa come out, I thought this is going to be right up my alleyway. It did play at Fright Fest last year, and uh, I did. remember some people saying one of the better films of Fright Fest, and uh, one of the worst films I've seen in about the last 10 years and i've seen some bad films gav it is appalling the acting the script the story the werewolf was actually just a rubber mask that you can purchase from any sort of joke or halloween novelty store and it was a british film which i didn't expect and i thought when i heard them speaking i thought oh okay this is british this might actually have a little bit of a uh, that british sort of sarcastic vibe to it but it just was awful awful film really ter- i can't recommend it in fact everyone on facebook who's sort of said oh i'm gonna watch i'm gonna watch shall i watch and i'm like do not save the worst thing is it's about i think it was about an hour and 40 as well it didn't deserve to be that long it's just a fucking piece of shit and i'm glad i didn't pay for it i gave it one out of ten because that's the lowest you can score See, something on imdb generally on here you are a more forgiving person with your stars <clears throat> yeah, I know, and I know. i'm i'm like the grouchy get off my lawn guy um uh, but wow yeah maybe i think it's 10 out of 10 you might do you might do um, um, I, I did also <clears throat> watch quick and the dead do you remember that film uh, the um, Sharon, Sharon Stone, Stone, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. It's Sam Raimi, isn't it? Yeah. Good, um, great movie. Great movie. I really enjoyed watching it again. Lance Henriksen and loads of people, actually. I really enjoyed it with uh, looking at it through the eye of director Sam Raimi because you could see like the different camera angles and the way he shoots things. It, it was uh, quite comical almost and uh, like cartoony in a way. He pulls great performances out of anyone he's ever worked with but specifically in this like russell crowe it's a great cast all the way through and everybody in it you know apparently bruce campbell came on to set and said sam what's going on where's my part and he was like i can't really give you a part because it's like sharon stone's production it's she she's she's just no, she had just come out blown out as like the big thing yeah. just after being sort of stitched up with her vagina being shown ham sandwich which she was told obviously that wasn't going to happen so it's a bit Paul Verhoeven that's pretty low <clears throat> below the belt in more ways than one it was it was and uh, anyway uh, he said oh, right fine go to costume um, so he comes back and says All right, um, you, you need to go up to that guy there his daughter and kind of try and chat up that daughter the guy's daughter uh, so then he's going to get an order of you can you just sort of do that in the background so yeah no worries no worries um to Bruce Campbell and he said to the other guy he says punch Bruce in the stomach when after he says that like really hard he's got padding don't worry about it oh. it's like a punchline it's like an obvious punchline I don't need to tell the joke we know what happens anyway come to film it Bruce Campbell gets punched in the gut and he's on the floor going, and he goes uh, Sam Raimi just goes great got it one shot and the cameraman's like we didn't have any film on the camera and he goes yep yeah, move on it's a love-hate relationship with those two, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I like that. I watched that. But I'll tell you what. I discovered a film which I would say... I'd, uh, be, do we cover it one day? It feels like a waste if it's my birthday episode and I've got the choice of two like, films. Do, do we cover it or not? But I watched a movie which I was like... A commentary track would be fucking incredible. And there might be something we could do Patreon if we are ever together because we could show the video possibly at the same time because we could do that on Patreon maybe. It's a movie mm. called Some Things Never Die from 1998 or Bug Buster. Oh, that's a bad title. It's I prefer the first one. Killer Cockroaches Swarm a, sh- a Small Lakeside Community. I, Love it. I kind of really enjoyed it. Uh, it's got I love, Randy I love, Quaid. I love a feature feature. Randy Quaid. As General George, and he's like a bug buster, and he turns up an hour into the movie, like, full-on, like... like like kind of um like arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. yeah yeah mm. i kind of like this film <laughs> it gets 3.9 out of 10 oh bless it and i don't know why but i kind of enjoyed it the effects were kind of cool in a way at times and there's just something about it where it kept moving kept going the whole time i was like it's 
no, at no point I've gone fuck this movie I watched the whole thing and I had it on with Elijah so occasionally I was like look at that Elijah oh, that looks gross and it'd be like cockroaches coming out of bodies and stuff but effects wise not too bad I, I, I don't know I can't say to people would you recommend uh, if I recommend it I would recommend it I guess if you're into sort of that sort of schlock but where to find it fuck knows absolutely have no idea well we, we can always um, I've got DVD. add it you can add it onto a future episode at some I, point. I think possibly, or or we did a commentary. I don't know because it'd be amazing for people to watch. If we're going to do that, I'll hold off on watching it so that I give my first honest feedback on it as, as at, we're watching at, it live. At the same time, <clears> it might be comical to just to read through that for people just listening to us. Yeah, it sounds fun. So, I love a creature feature. So I almost thought, do, do I pull Studio Six 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 and put that on? I was like, I can't. No, so, no I won't. I'll keep it as it is. I watched um, a Christmassy film a bit early, but I thought after watching that back that uh, Werewolf Santa the following evening, you had to dilute and get something better. Yeah, so I watched some something that I heard was good, and I was thinking it isn't going to be that good. I watched Violent Night, ah, which came yes. out last Christmas. Yeah, Sarah and I saw that actually. Um, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, I don't. I think you weren't as quite into it as I was but I, I, I the thing was I'm going to really enjoy it the second time round because I didn't know it was a real Father Christmas yeah so that <clears> threw me because I thought it was a dude just Father Christmas something happens he takes revenge because the way they sell it with John Wick I didn't think it was going to be a real Santa Claus like Fat Santa Mel Gibson's a real Santa Claus and you just have to believe there's a world where a real Santa exists yeah so that confused me in the movie what, and some what, of the people in the movie didn't know that he's real either, so I was a bit confused yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, what was cool about it is, because it's made, obviously it's made for adults, because it is quite a violent yeah, yeah, film yeah. full of swearing. John Leg- Leguizamo pretty much plays his character from Die Hard 2 in it, um, as the, the head of the baddies. But because it's made for our age group, who grew up watching Home Alone and all these sort of it has got yeah. sweet and sugary film. It's got that in it. So you're sort of sucked into the whole, like, oh, the family, oh, the kid. But out of the blue, we get this violence comes in. And for me, it was a perfect sweet spot. No, of- I, I'm going to enjoy it second time round. I, it wasn't yeah. what I expected. But I did enjoy the fact it flipped it to the slight Home Alone in a loft stuff and yeah and you know there, there was there's was enough references to die hard and home alone it knew what it was doing yeah one scene did frustrate me though because i messaged you about it and they legitimately just took die hard and i know everybody is gonna know that but i was just like why are you doing and like literally almost word by word like the phrase in the way it was i was like why are you doing that when he's locked he's sitting in the chair tied up yeah that spot and i was like that's i don't I'm happy with that though because I love seeing. Yeah, that, that. annoyed me because it's too. It was too like, yes, look, we're doing Die Hard. And like, what? what? I also like, like the much. characters in it. Um, Less is I more. thought, I thought David Harbour was great. He was very funny. Yeah, yeah. And and it was quite a different story. Uh, you know, we've seen so many origin stories for Santa, um, but this was like you could double bill with Fat Santa. In Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was great. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. It's going on my rewatch list for next year, um, and it probably will become one that I watch regularly. I think it, it's it's got a real mean streak to it. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is also weirdly a Christmas film because after that, I thought that was great, and everyone was talking about a film called There's Something in the Barn. Um, which only came out about two weeks ago. Yeah, the trailer, look, the trailer looks kind of fun. <clears throat> Again, this was phenomenal. Oh, good. Um, it was a perfect blend of Krampus um, meets... There was a, an element of Home Alone, of um, Gremlins to it, but it was more Krampus and Rare Exports blended together, so it was really mean-spirited, very funny, but very adult. And you don't expect that because the violence doesn't come to about the midway point but it without spoiling it at all uh, all it is is an american family decide to go back to norway which is where the dad of the family's grandfather is originally from so he's like very part, small part norwegian to uh, renovate a farm and a barn into an airbnb and that's going to be how they make their money is their business what they don't realize is there is a a barn elf 
living in the barn who there are certain rules that if you don't treat the barn elf right it will fuck you up but if you look after it it will do things like clear the snow off your lawn all this kind of stuff very funny um Small, you'll like it because it's a small town everyone knows each other it's very snowy because it's in norway um and it's, a, it's like that fish out of water american very american family you know californian family who are used to sun and sunshine and being on twitter but then they're suddenly in the middle of nowhere where there's no wi-fi there's no nothing other than snow really good really good fun and the last half an hour 40 minutes is just like a massacre and it's amazing and yeah really that only came out a few weeks ago there's something in the barn um it's on prime you can rent it um for about three quid honestly <clears throat> it would but double bill so well with krampus i would say or rare exports you know either of those two really but it is got it's definitely got some gremlins stuff to it as well and you'll see what i mean when you watch it but yeah great 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 film so that really got me in the christmas spirit um you know so yeah cool. i'm really pleased so it, it took david harbour uh, with a giant mallet killing bad guys and little gnomes uh, in a barn to defeat the bad taste in my mouth of the werewolf santa and uh we made a short film but me and the kids santa claus <clears throat> You did many yeah. years ago. The children yeah. were tiny then, weren't they? Yeah. Um, um, right. Anything else you've watched? Or no, no. I'm happy to get on with the episode. No. Wow. Cats. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so, what, are we covering the uh, stage or uh, stage show? Cats. It, oh god, I've heard that the film, the movie version, is Should really we do disturbing. That and then we can actually do, do a half it and uh, like an episode dedication to. Um, What's he called? That one we don't like. Moved, went to America. Oh, James Presents. Corden. Yeah. Oh, listen, God. listen. <sighs> if I was, if if I had a gun, Fuck that dude, and there was James Corden or Ellis from Die Hard in front of me, I would shoot James Corden. I'd let Ellis live. Ellis is fine compared to her. James Corden. Oh my God. Ellis is a dick though. I do see on a, I see a, a social network things. Uh, uh, American audiences going. Like, I don't understand why English don't like him, but I guess it's because uh, of our humour, our joy humour, and he just doesn't do it well. That's why. No. And it becomes <clears throat> very cheap and cheesy and not funny. Um, but I think that translates to other countries with that they find it funny. Obviously, he must do because he's done very well over in America. I am. Um, I'm but going. No, he's very, terrible. <laughs> just very quickly before we we go into the trailer for Cat's Eye, um, I'm going to watch later in the month. I'm going to be watching The Gruffalo at the cinema with my children now this is my first cinema experience my, my wife's been already with them a couple of times and i'm really excited but then i found out that james corden does the voice of the mouse in it. oh no and i'm just gonna be like ah, i'm in the cinema with my children at least you don't have to look at him yeah that's true yeah <clears throat> i'll just be wanting the gruffalo to eat that mouse all the way through it yeah, fuck that mouse but listen don't, enough about james corden fuck a mouse people let's not get, don't fuck a mouse you're not Richard Gear. Um, now, gerbil? I think it was a gerbil up his bottom, wasn't it? Yeah, gerbil gear, GG. <laughs> I get the gerbil gear. Uh, right. <laughs> he he well, slipped into gerbil gear. <laughs> talking of small furry animals. Talking of small, fur, small furry animals, we're going to be reviewing, first of all, Cat's Eye from 1985. So. Before we get any more um, naughty, let's get into a trailer for Cat's Eye from 1985. Yeah, let's not all slip into gerbil gear. Oh, that's... Oh. Stephen King, your favourite novelist and master of modern horror, has written his first motion picture screenplay. It combines all the elements of his creative imagination. <laughs> Lovable pets... Classic cars. Quiet evenings. Favorite films. Kill the son of a... <laughs> Good idea. Adorable kids. Help me. It's after me. And of course, a monster or two. Experience a series of electrifying adventures. As seen through Stephen King's Cat's Eye. Where 
Where's your sense of humor? <laughs> Okay, so that was the trailer, and here is our review of Cat's Eye from 1985. Rated PG-13. One hour, 34 minutes. Mm. A stray cat is the linking element of three tales of suspense and horror. My first viewing. It is, yeah, that's right. So it's a horror anthology. Um, it's written by Stephen King. In fact, two of the segments were appeared in the Night Shift book series he did of short short stories. Um, so it's got that Stephen King vibe to it. Um, it's also directed by Lewis Teague. Now, Gab's familiar with Lewis Teague because he recently, for the first time, watched Cujo, didn't you, Gav? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I still didn't watch it because I... I like dogs, and I don't like children being <laughs> under threat. I like dogs! And uh, uh, they're just two elements that come together in a negative way for me, even though it probably not might not be portrayed that bad. I just... Uh, uh, well, you will have seen a couple of his films, because he also directed Alligator from 1980, which we reviewed oh, yeah. many, 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 about nine years ago. Uh, he also reviewed... Um, sorry, reviewed... He also directed The Jewel of the Nile. So, so he's to blame. For me as a child, at night times going to sleep going what so anything you put down the toilet just grows and alligators just grow down the toilet and then you were wow, putting your penis down the toilet giant fish down the toilet and uh in the sewers and you know it made me uh think and have nightmares i'm sure yeah so i the first time i saw this um we recorded it off of the television Oof sometime in the 90s when I was still a teenager living with my parents. Yeah, it missed me. I, I never sort of saw it for whatever reason. Well, I just saw it in the uh, in the newspaper and I saw that it said Stephen King's Cat's Eye and I thought, oh, I like Stephen King. Um, and I saw that it said starring Drew Barrymore. So I recorded it. That was that. However, I don't know how, but me and my sister only ever saw, because we watched this together, we, and we only saw the last segment. So we just saw this the segment with the little creature and we thought someone, oh, someone recorded like tag it yeah I don't, I don't know how um but then somehow i think my sister probably got hold of the full film on vhs or dvd or something do you love back in the day just like videotapes be the black videotape you'd be on there and there'd be something written on it and it's rubbed off something else is written on it. it's rubbed and it's just like fuck was that and you put it on it and right at the end you get something else then that'll finish and you get like just different versions of yeah. things at the end yeah and you'd get to know them like, late you? night telly shit even like all the videos we recorded off of the TV at Christmas time, you know, it'd have all the adverts on in, on the ad breaks. Oh, you'd, yeah, yeah. Because you'd watch those films so many times, you'd know the adverts, you know? The, the best, the beautiful thing of YouTube now is you can actually go like, right, I want the winter 1985 ITV, uh, you know, Channel 3 in the England um, uh, adverts or something. Yeah. And you probably get them. And it's great. Yeah. It is fun. It is fun. But yeah, so I didn't get to see the full version of this till much later when I'd moved out and I was in my mid twenties, and I was very shocked that the first two were um, not anything like the third one, which is more fantastical. Were you quite excited? I was like going like I can't believe I'm going to watch it. I've never seen the last segment. Of yeah, because to me, it, times. It, it was only about thirty minutes long to me, you know. Um, but actually, the first segment with J james woods is more like something that cronenberg would do um with the whole smoking thing and then the middle segment is just like this almost alfred hitchcock paranoia balancing on the edge of a building horrible thing and then the last one is full-on almost a bit spielbergy because it's got drew barrymore in it and a little creature and a cat very three very different but it, to me i i still loved it and you know, I was really excited to add this to our list, and I thought it'd be a good little pairing with Twilight Zone because they're both they're only a couple of years apart, and they're horror anthologies. Twilight Zone, everybody knows that movie and talks about that movie, but not many people, including yourself, had either seen or already even heard of Cat's Eye. So, really uh, happy to chat about that with you. Um, but yeah, this is your first viewing. So, without giving any spoilers yet, um, about giving away whether you give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, your first viewing. Any thoughts that you can? 
share with us? Um, I knew Drew Barrymore was in it. I didn't know James Woods was in it. Um, I, I <laughs> it, it was okay. I, I think, you know, I, I'm the age I am in 2023. It didn't hold my interest as much as something else might do. Um, I don't know. It's also anthology films. It's always you're always an up. It's a roller coaster with them. It always is. This was only three, so it's not like a multiple of like ten or twenty or so where you can go, oh, oh, next one's coming or the ABC's a death or something like that. You know, next one's coming. Next one comes if you don't like that. Next one. Um, but all right. Um, I don't think I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't, I just don't know how I didn't see it. I, I think maybe the front cover was... Was it always just like Drew Barrymore's little girl? Was that always the cover? No, the, most of the cover is, is just the cat. Um, uh, maybe I just words, saw that and thought, you know... The words Stephen, I think the word Stephen King above it will, would always, you know, sell me. Um, That's true. Um, I think I think it's in the dawning of... Well, not the dawning. We're in, in the age then of this, in the video shop with the fucking amazing artwork. And it probably just didn't catch my eye, and I just didn't, whatever reason, see it. I don't know why. Yeah, Is well, it? it's it's all good. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, well, well, let's get on to it. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. So, um, the there is. A... I did like the opening. It's quite interesting. I thought that was quite fun. I like the cats. The, the cats Cujo, got a theme tune. The Cujo following the cat, and then yeah. the Christine car. And Christine. And I wanted more. Yeah, it's pretty cool that all that kind of stuff happens. Yeah. So yeah, at the beginning. So essentially these stories are linked by a cat and wasn't that story um, like pulled out apparently like uh the, the producers thought that was just all director no director wanted to do it the uh, producer said no we're not going to put that in it's a bit more of a story explaining the significance of the cat and why uh, and they said no don't bother and uh, the director's a bit gutted by it i think i read that i think there was going to be more backstory of the cat yeah, yeah. but um yeah, so the cat essentially is travelling across America. So it starts off uh, running from Gujo, almost getting run over by Christine, which are clever little nods. Um, and then it sees, it keeps seeing images of Drew Barrymore in different forms, saying, help me, he's going to get me, it's coming after me. Um, and then we go to our first segment, um, because the cat is picked up by a man who works for a lab where they test things on animals, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, and we start off with our first segment, which is called Quitters Incorporated, starring our man James Woods as um, Dick Morrison. And we've got to remember, uh, it was interesting <clears throat> watching this because I was just going back to then. I grew up, my childhood is being around people smoking constantly everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, cinema, fucking everywhere. It was just a thing. It wasn't. Uh, it was just the normal thing to do. It's just a smoke cigarettes. I've been going through some old, um, a box basically of probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cigarettes. No, I'm joking. Someone hundreds... pulls out a straight <laughs> cigarette now. I kind of look at them. It's like, yeah. No, no, hundreds uh. and hundreds and hundreds of photographs I've been going through. Um, and I've been actually get rid of some of them or, or deciding which ones i want to keep just because they take up a lot of room um and there's, there's me in the pub you know at 20 20 odd years old and there's people around me and they're all smoking in the pub and it's, it just feels such a long time ago that all that sort of stuff happened doesn't it can't imagine smoking inside now my first job even hospitals People smoked in the office in my first job when I was 16, 17. Oh, I, I used to uh, uh, work at British American Tobacco in London. And oh they had cigarettes on the side. They made you smoke there. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the cigarettes and ashtrays and lighters on the side. You could just take packets of cigarettes, put them in your pocket. It just light up cigarettes while you work and smoke. That's great, isn't it? You don't get that in other jobs. Working in Cadbury's Chocolate Factory and they're just handing you loads and loads of Cadbury's Chocolate and everyone's waddling around having heart attacks. No, uh, I've worked at lots of different, really interesting places. Um, do you remember um, what those drinks, the glass ones, and the lid would pop? Um, There's loads of different flavours. Uh, so I think it's an American drink, but it hadn't been in England for a long time. Yeah, I do. Sunkiss? No one knows. Oh, for fuck's sake. The little one, the little pop. Sunny D? No, it wasn't that. I can't remember what they were now. But yeah, I remember just sitting in the fridge was stacked. Let's drink as much as you like. So it's like, you just sit there and having competitions with people, how many you could drink. 
without dying. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Well, we start off with, so after the cat has been taken into this laboratory, we start off with our man, James Woods, and he's sat in a car outside this clinic in, uh, I believe, New York City. And he sat with his friend and he's very nervous about going in this clinic. And his friend says, look, come on, dick, do it. Just go inside. It's fine. They, you know, they're a really good clinic. <laughs> And it's a clinic to help people quit smoking. God damn, do they help people quit smoking? Fucking hell. Fucking hell. They this will is... rape your wife if you have a cigarette. They actually have a man who will... They keep, they literally keep the dirty man around, they class him as, to rape people. I, 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 I'm, I'm imagining he will rape anything. Jesus Christ. I imagine it's not just to women. I imagine he's not sexist upon any way with his raping. I reckon it's fucking everywhere. Brilliant. And, and they keep this dude, and this is how gnarly they are, right? You yeah. quit, uh, quit smoking. This is why. If you don't, you're, you're, everyone's fucked, and we don't mean they're dead. They're actually going to be fucked by rapey man over here. So this is why this segment feels quite like a bit of a Cronenberg movie to me. It was it's pretty very fun. dark. I, I was not expecting that so much when it came in. It was like cigarettes was like, because that was a bit more of a sore, not a sore point nowadays, but a bit more of a, a thing. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I noticed that straight away. But then, like, that we've got to go and reach people. What the fuck, you know? I think honestly, um, I would say to you, Gav, maybe give this a second view in it sometime because I Possibly. think once you go into it, having seen it a few times, you can really notice all the little fun things in it because it is fun in a dark way. But yeah, so he goes into the office and he sees a man crying in the reception area. I'm not surprised. Um, and he thinks, bloody hell, they, they must have some good techniques in here. I don't know why he's Tactics. crying so much. Tactics, yeah. the rapey man. He's really crying. Um, but yeah, uh, he he sits down and he thinks, shall I have a cigarette while I'm waiting to go in? And he thinks, actually, there's signs everywhere, you know, saying don't smoke. And there's no ashtrays. And he thinks, uh, probably shouldn't. Okay. So uh, a man comes out. Um, oh, before that, sorry, the man who's crying, his wife comes out and hits him with a handbag. And we think, well, what's going on here? Well, this this is a scenario that James Woods is going to become familiar with much later on. So, yeah, he's very confused. The doctor comes out and says, ah, Dick, come on in. We're going to change your life. Now, I've got a few questions, um, just a form to fill out. Um, do you, you've got a daughter, haven't you? A 10-year-old daughter? Yeah. What's her name? what what's her school and, and james Wood actually says like i'm not going to tell you that's not, nothing to do with this and he's like don't worry we'll find out and he's like oh, why do you need to know this and he's like and then you've got your wife of course your lovely wife yeah okay we know all this about you anyway uh, and they're a bit like the men in black these guys it seems um and he locks the door he hawks out at this point. He says, have you got any cigarettes on you at the moment? He's, he says, of course I've got cigarettes on me. I've always got a pack of cigarettes on me. So he walks over and he locks the door. And he says, put the cigarettes on the desk. And the doctor just goes crazy and smashes them with his fists to pieces. It's and you're almost, thinking... It's almost a bit comical. I don't want to be in this room now. This is, he's locked me in. And he says, we do have ra rather, some would say, radical methods within our clinic. Um, and he says, look at this cat. And this is our cat. General, his name is the cat. Um, he's in a room, a glass room. And he says, look at this cat over here. See this cat? And they start playing, um, come on, shake it up, baby. Shake it up, baby. Twist and shout. But as the music comes on, they electrify the floor. So this cat is being electrocuted, <laughs> jumping all over the place. In time to the music, comically. Very Stephen King. And the cat is going absolutely nuts. Now, they didn't do this for real, Gav. You'd be pleased to know they didn't electrocute the cat for real. So, what did they do? They had the cat's handler was underneath the floor with, um, like, a, an air spray canister. So, it was just basically spraying air at the cat's feet, making the cat sort of jump in a fun way. It wasn't... They weren't harming it. It was literally just spraying air underneath it to make it jump around. Um, I just wanted well, you and our listeners to know. Physically, it didn't harm it. Mentally, the cat might be scared of gusts of wind. <laughs> the cat's lying there and it farts. And it's like, oh my God, what was that? Well, the they got a dog as well. It's like a pit bull and it just farts next to its head. 
Uh, I'm getting flashbacks to that laboratory. Trauma, trauma. Um, yeah, so, but James Wood is obviously very angry. He says, oh, what's going on here? How, how can you do this? And the doctor says, look, we've got certain techniques here. But what I can tell you is we've got a 100% success rate. And uh, you will be watched. And let's just say that if you do smoke a cigarette, it will be your wife that's doing the twist and shout in that room. And if it's not your wife, it could be your daughter. And, you know, we've also got a guy that we keep around because we could go ahead as far as raping your wife. So, you know, and this is a guy that just wants to smoke cigarettes. He's not on heroin, you know. He's I know. not. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> the tactics are quite, quite good. Maybe these tactics, you know. maybe these tactics could work nowadays for other things. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty like full politicians. on. Politicians. When they're, when they're under oath trying to tell the truths, we, we sort of say, well... <laughs> so, Donald Trump, we will We've got an electric you. fence. Your, your wife, Ivanka, <laughs> what's she called? Fonka? Ivanka. Willy Wonka. Bloody hell. Willy Wonka Trump. A Wonka sounds... Trump. <laughs> let's, Ooh, not get into what a, Wonka Trump. let's not get into what a Wonka Trump could be. At one point, the President of the United States, surname was another word for fart yeah all the meanwhile the prime minister of england's surname was another word for penis we had johnson and trump in power i always found that very funny when those two were in power particularly because they were like two versions of the same buffoon as well well i i'd never really thought of the name trump until until he became, he became a the uh, uh thingy boss the big big cheese of america and um and uh, uh, I never thought about it. So as soon as it happened, I was like Trump. I was like Trump, and I was like, that's just a name for far. <laughs> like that's a, that's an English slang for far. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, it was funny. So James Woods goes home and he's watching on TV. What's he watching, Gav, on TV? He's watching the ice. It's gonna break. Ice. It's gonna break. He's watching oh, God, Dead Zone, yeah. and he actually says, "Oh, I can't watch these movies. Whoever writes these movies is appalling." <gasps> oh, it's Stephen King. It's a little in joke. It's another in joke to the Stephen King verse. Hey, how hilarious! I thought it was good. I like that. He almost has a fag, uh, a cigarette. For, sorry, that's the slang. By the way, fag is, is English slang. For, yes, if, is if it American slang a... as well? Fag? No, 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 no. Um, I've got a fag in my notes quite a lot because if... it's just. Just to explain to anybody who's not from the UK, and you may already know this anyway, but in the UK, cigarettes quite often are called fags, um, F-A-G, but we're not using that in a derogatory term in any way. Uh, in fact, we both hate that word and that use of that word. Yeah, yeah, it's fag. Uh, this is, this word is actually just three letters fag. I, I started writing sig in my notes, siggies. I, I actually just put fag, and it was actually a little way into my notes. I was like, oh, I've wrote fag for because I don't even... Yeah, uh, it's probably it's funny. because it's, it's be, funny. because it's easier to, and quicker to write in my ADHD brain than cigarette. No, you're you're right. It is quick, quick and easier to write. Um, so he's he imagines um being told, you know, he's starting to picture this guy getting in his head. You know, oh, you're gonna there's gonna be things happening to your wife and your daughter. You know, you, you do the rape thing comes up in his head again. We may even go as far as killing them, and he's really stressed. <laughs> His wife's really concerned. She's like, James Woods, what is wrong with you today? How he much says, have you paid these people? Well, she doesn't know about any of this <laughs> I yet. I know she doesn't. Yeah. But she says, what, what earth is wrong with you? Why? And he's like, I just want some fucking ice cream, okay? She's like, whoa, calm down, honey. Angry and he's like, James Wood wants ice cream. Imagine James Wood comes in the house and he just fucking declares angry ice cream. He does angry quite well, James Woods, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, It'd be like Nicolas Cage coming in your house demanding... You need those two in a, a buddy comedy cop oh, movie. That'd be too much. Too much. I couldn't <laughs> take it. But, um, yeah, his wife says, look, what, what's wrong? Why do you want ice cream so bad? He says, if he must know, I quit smoking today. She actually laughs at him. She says, you? My God, come on. But he doesn't tell her the full story. He says, look, just let me deal with this. You know, it's, I haven't had a cigarette since 3 p.m. It's now about 9 p.m. I'm doing well. I just need some fucking ice cream. Um, so that's that. Night time. It's raining. It's very atmospheric. He wakes up. And he thinks, 
think I've got some cigarettes in my desk downstairs in my study. So he sneaks down, go after the name. Little he opens the toe. drawer, tip top, tip top. And he goes in and he, he thinks, oh, yes, I knew I had some cigarettes in here. No one will know. These threats are meaningless. No one's really watching me. He takes one out and he just puts it in his mouth. And then he hears a noise. And he looks looks at the, the closet door and he thinks, well, that, what, is there something in here? And it's quite a frightening moment here because he opens the door. There's no one there. But then he looks down and he sees two wet boots sticking out from behind all the coats in there there's someone in his closet watching him oh that old chest up yeah he says there's someone there i didn't smoke i didn't smoke i just came to check my golf clubs and he runs off and we see a little drip of water running down the shoes and that's that so he's gone back to bed he doesn't know really if that was a nightmare if it really happened but either way they're getting in his psyche now gav yeah yeah, he's totally paranoid they're getting in there. This is a bit like um, hypnosis, isn't it? People that have gone for hypnosis. And it's stuff. a fairly yeah. effective way. You, you know, like getting into the sort of to uh, really break into the mind and make this paranoia is really detracting away from, and it's really full on gnarly, like hard, harm, hardcore way. Harm of doing it. will harm will come to your wife and daughter if you smoke a cigarette. And and that paranoia, the fear of pain, death. Uh, uh, loss of people or anyone hurt or anything yeah triggering all of this like see a pair of boots like he would have if it, that wasn't going on he's not going to think that when he opened it he might go his boots he goes not really someone there but with this it's like there could be someone there well in the morning he comes downstairs and he sees wet footprints on the floor so this confirms there was definitely somebody in his house he thinks this is real this is actually happening so he goes to his daughter's school um <clears throat> she's uh like um learning challenge i think isn't she is she learning challenge i'm not sure i'm not sure um but he goes to pick her up from school and give her a cabbage patch kid because it's the 80s product placement uh because he loves her and he feels a bit bad you know that he may have put her in danger by having a cigarette last night so he gives her a a cabbage patch kid and then he sees the doctor and he thinks what the fuck is he doing here and he says you love her don't you you love your daughter and he says look you can't be here. You can't, you can't keep me under constant supervision. One of your men was in my house last night. And he laughs. He goes, <laughs> were they? Were they? Hmm? And he's thinking, oh, man, what is going on here? Well, we get the first part of the song from, well, it isn't the police because they weren't allowed to use the actual song by Sting and the police. So it, they used it, a cover version of it. It wouldn't have been run loud. It was probably too fucking expensive. Yeah, that's what I mean. They they they, they didn't have the back the budget for it. So... Um, Everybody's instead, smoking at this party. Yeah, he's at this party. Every breath you take. Which is quite comical, isn't it, really? Every move you make. But also it relates to... Um, Later the on. Last, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. so it's quite, quite a good use of that song. I bet they were gutted when Sting... What a prick. Imagine throwing it at Sting. Hiya, Sting. Um, we're making this film. It's about this, this, and this. And what would tie everything in perfectly is your song... Can we have it for a bit of a, a lower price? And he's like, nah. Nah, you can't have my song. All right, we'll just get someone else to sing it then. All right. <laughs> who sang it? I don't know who it was. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, not, it's not unheard of or uncommon to do that, though. Just get a cover song. It's so much cheaper. But I swear to God, this so this party that James Woods... I swear to God, watching this scene, I felt like my clothes smelt of cigarettes because... I think the only person not smoking at that party is James Woods. And everybody's puffing away, aren't they? You've got to say, that's a good test for him. Fucking hell. Jesus Christ. Why did he go there? Hmm. That'd be like um, giving up booze, which is something I've done a few months ago, and then going to a a massive sort of piss-up somewhere and just sort of sitting there like, (laughs) this is fine, this is fine. Or giving up heroin and doing like a marathon of train spotting over and over and over and over again just make you want to go back to heroin i did enjoy watch that last time i saw it because i thought i wouldn't because the baby thing i actually think i looked at my phone and the baby thing came up yeah it's a bit but off that pretty good film it's a bit much isn't it um 
yeah, he really, really, really wants a cigarette. And people are saying, hey, come on, Dick, have a cigarette. And he's like, oh, no, thanks, no, thanks. I quit. You quit? No, come on. But then he starts hallucinating. People are becoming human cigarettes or human packets of cigarettes. One guy's like got ten cigarettes hanging out of his mouth. There's a picture of eyes in it looking around. Yeah, there is. Spying on him like a Scooby-Doo. Um very, very Scooby Doo. And then, then he hallucinates that the doctor is walking down the stairs at the party, singing, Every breath you take, I'll be watching you. And he thinks, I've got to get out of this fucking party. So he does, he leaves. It's like and out, of something out of like society, isn't it? It is a bit like that. I, I would like to see more of this clinic and what, what they do. We should we should do society one time. I would well. It's it's down on the list to do as a Brian um, Brian, Brian Yisner, oh. yeah. So that'll be definitely one that we're covering because that is a fucked up film and I love it. Uh, so he leaves anyway. The next day he's driving along in his car, sun shining. He's got his convertible top down in his car and he's happy. He's got music playing. Oh, he gets into a traffic jam and he's like, oh. Oh. the bridge opens, doesn't it? The bridge opens up. So he's got to wait. And he thinks, oh, dear. Oh, I've dropped my tape, my cassette tape. Let me just pick that up. Oh, what's this under the seat? What is it, Gav? He's got a little packet of cigarettes. Yeah. And he thinks, well, come on. No one's around. I'm in a traffic jam. And he looks around him, paranoid. Just normal people in their cars going about their business. I get it, though. I understand where he's coming from. It's like, oh, fuck it. Like, literally, like, I'm alone. No one's going to know. I'll this still, is I'll a really him, but... it's a really good scene because he he, he he crunches down in the bottom of his car and he's really sort of hunched down and he lights a cigarette and he takes that drag and you see like oh thank god oh feels good to do that then the bridge reopens and people are driving around him to go over the bridge and he's, his car isn't going anywhere because he's sort of having a few puffs hunched down and then he sits up and he looks over and he sees a man in a sports car with a woman next to him, they just smile at him. And it's such an evil smile, like, you fucked up. And they just speed away. And he thinks, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I've got to get home to my family, I've got to get home to my family. So he speeds off, he goes home. No one's there. Food's burning in the kitchen. It's like almost like his wife's been snatched, snatched away. He can't find her anywhere. And he gets a phone call. And it's the doctor. Hello, Dick. Uh, I trust 5 p.m. will be a good time for you today. He's like, what have you done to my wife? What have you done? He's like, I'll be seeing you at 5 p.m., Dick. We'll see you later. Goodbye. And he just hangs up on him. It's fucking awful. He's thinking, what are they going to do to her? He arrives at the clinic and he gets dragged into the room. And there she is. She's in the glass glass case, isn't she? Yep. And he says, look, I can, you, you can't do this. This is inhuman. She's about to have air blown up at her. She's... <laughs> <laughs> but in, for the purposes of the film... Marilyn Monroe style. Yeah. If only it was that. She's getting shocked. Imagine if Marilyn Monroe was like, ooh, it tickles my bits. Well, that might be why she liked doing that. I'm sure it was. <laughs> Have you ever put a hair dryer down there? I, I, I would, I would go there stand in a dressing gown with no pants on, Fuck and I would underpants. This is for our American and uh, Canadian listeners, or whatever, uh, and stand over a drain with a, a Marilyn Monroe little wig on, a bit of makeup, and uh, I would do it. I'd have the gus go up there and see what happened, and I expect I might like it. I've got the weirdest boner right now. <laughs> It's not weird. It's accepted. It's, uni- <laughs> it's universal, don't worry. Everyone's enjoying it right now. Gav's butt is universal. It's for everybody. Me just as Ma- Baron among Robot in a dressing gown. Weird, man. Weird. I've seen you in makeup. Ooh. Because um, your children, when they were younger... Oh, um, yeah. Did you in makeup a couple of times, actually. So I've seen I've seen what you might look like. <clears throat> we were going to have a geldy night the other night, actually. Yeah. Uh, they knew what to paint my nails, Daisy did. And I was like, oh, you did my toenails. not touching your feet. And I, oh, okay. Oh, yes, because uh, they painted your toenails once when you did a couple of, um, I think you did a couple of kickboxing lessons or something, no, didn't you? My, I only ever did one fucking kickboxing lesson, because that's what I'm like. <laughs> uh, went along and, uh, and I was like, ah, oh, shit. And I'd like, painted toenails glittery it, toenails it made an impression and I could kick the bag fairly hard so you know, <laughs> it people were like have you seen old twinkle toes over there fucking oh he's skinhead good skinhead beard and painted toenails 
they wouldn't have known what to do with you. They'd have been like, here's a new new student, let's kick his out. Oh, <clears> hang <throat> on a minute, he's got glittery toenails. I think he made an impression, so... All right, well done. Um, so, yes, he his wife's getting an electric shock in this room, um, and he he starts having a bit of a scrap with the guys in the in the lab there's a big henchman and the doctor a few punches are thrown um in the ruckus the cat general escapes and runs off onto the next story in the segment in the trilogy um but um twist and shout starts playing it's all very comical um woods watches at gunpoint um you've got some explaining to do to your wife don't you come on you need to explain to her so they put them in a room together and he says he has a bet with his henchman he says i've seen this this go two ways which way do you think it's gonna go do you think he's gonna confess and he says yeah so he confesses to her she hugs him and uh the cat jumps on a boat leaves new york city harbor and we cut to some time later at the clinic. Yeah. So there, he's still having checkups, you know. <clears throat> Can't believe he hasn't smoked cigarettes for as long as it's been. He's very, very buddy buddy now with them. With the guy who potentially was going to get his really? wife raped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely like it's a contrast to what we've just seen. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. And he weighs him and he says, Well, you're doing really well, but you have put a little bit of weight on. Um,. What I'm going to do, Mr. James Woods, is prescribe these diet pills to you. And he says, oh, come on, three or four pounds isn't a lot, is it? And he says, well, you know, he says, what are you going to do if I don't take these pills? <laughs> well, we'll cut off your wife's little finger. Ha, <laughs> ha, They will have a big laugh about it. And then, again, sometime later, it goes on again. And he gets together with some buddies who've all been through this clinic. And... Um, they all say, yeah, here's to Quitters Incorporated. And they have a drink and they cheers together. And as they cheers together, dun, 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 one of the wives of his friends is missing her little finger. Yep. So that's your opening segment. Quitters thing. I like it. It's fun. It's got some paranoia sort of bits in it. Uh, it's interesting to watch <clears> it in 2023, the whole smoking thing. And growing up with that sort of thing anyway, it was quite interesting to see. But yeah, it, it was okay. As well. Yeah, as James Woods, <clears throat> it had to have someone good in that role. And I think James Woods was the guy at the time that could do it. So yeah, I was happy with that. This is, uh, uh, the score in this was pretty bad at times. And, and this was actually the uh, composer of the of Predator soundtrack. Oh. And Silver Street. Well, I really liked his... Um, I think this was his first horror film he did. I like the the cat seems to have like its own superhero theme tune, and whenever that plays, I kind of like it. Yeah, it might have been just at that point then, uh, as what my notes said. Well, we are about to get started on our second of the three stories, and this second one is called The Ledge. In the words of Rakim, I guess I didn't know The Ledge. Knowledge. See what he did there? He was a clever man, that Rakim. He still is. He's not dead. I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, so, we see the cat. And the cat's been fed by a homeless guy. And he's in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And again, he sees Drew Barrymore, visions of her, this time on TV, saying, Help me, General. He's coming for me. Help me. And this cat's like, okay, cool. We never really understand why the cat sees these visions. Is it a magic cat? You know, it doesn't matter, really, does it? Um, but, yeah, so uh, he sees a gambler uh, at the casino. And this gambler is uh, having a great old time. And he leaves. leaves. Yeah. And what we don't know is one of the gamblers is a mob boss and the other one is an ex-tennis player. He's got a bit of a gambling problem. And they leave the, the casino, you know, having won or lost some money. They're all laughing and joking. And let's go to the next casino. OK, yeah, let's do that. And then they see the cat. And the cat is trying to cross a very busy road, Gav. A very busy road. And they are very cruel here. They put a bet of $2,000 down onto whether or not the cat will make it across the road, whether the cat will die. And what they do is... It is quite cruel, yeah. They go, come on. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm, I can do whatever I want to help my bet. So if the cat gets killed by a car, then you lose. So one of the guys is trying to 
call the cat actively across the road to make it get hit by the cars. But luckily, because the cat's magic or whatever, it makes it across the road, but does cause an absolutely huge crash. From the sounds we hear, <clears throat> this is really just a uh, uh, like giving us a sort of introduction to our main character and what he's like. Yeah, Johnny is an ex-tennis player who has now got a bit of a gambling problem, but he has been having an affair and is in love with Kresner, who is sort of a mafioso crime boss. He's in love with his wife, which is bad. You don't want to have an affair with a mafia boss's wife, Gav. Trust me, I've been there. I was sleeping with the fishies. He can't say who, what mafia boss, I suppose. I can't say that, no. Right. But, um... Don't want concrete boots. They they listen to this show, so... Oh, shit, there's only one that listens to this show, and now he knows. Mm. Oh, well, that's the end of... This is the last episode, then. Um, no, so he's having an affair with um, Crescent's wife, and they are actually in love, and he said they plan to escape together, and he says, you get on this bus and I'll meet you later on. I've just got to go and do a few bits and bobs. But before he can do anything, he is kidnapped by two of Kresner's henchmen. Now, this is a more um, grounded story, isn't it? The first one is a bit more almost sci-fi. This, uh, upon reflection now, uh, uh, as we talk about it, is reminding me of the uh, segment of Quentin Tarantino and Bruce Willis. Yes, exactly. In our four rooms, the last segment. And it's uh, basically just uh, um, rich white people uh, taking advantage of other people for their own pleasure and gain. Yeah, it's definitely got, feels like it could have I been. They, they don't do that in four rooms, I guess, but, uh, but they're definitely doing this. This this could have been in that movie. This could have been a segment in that movie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They drive him. They drive Johnny in the trunk of the car to Kresner's um, penthouse. They stash some heroin in his car. They take him up to Kresner, and Kresner says, "Look, I've set you up. I know what you, what you've been planning to do with my wife. I know you're in love with her. Just tell me where my wife is, and I've got a wager for you." If you don't tell me where she is, you're going to get. We, well, the police will arrive and you'll be arrested for having heroin in your car. But if you tell me where she is, then, you know, I'll let you go and that's it. You know, I just need to know where she is because I need to speak to her. Johnny thinks, well, this is all a bit. Do I tell them? I don't know. But he says, look, here's my wager. Johnny, you used to be a tennis player, you're an athletic guy. This building, this penthouse, we're on the top floor, by the way, Gav, very high up. You need to circumvent, this is not circumvent, circumnavigate, which isn't circumcised, by the way, it's a different word. Basically, you need to climb the around the entire exterior of this building just using a ledge. If you can do that, keep my wife, what keep if, the car. What if he started doing it and they bumped into Rakim out on the ledge? <laughs> oh, have you been here before? Yeah, I know the ledge. Yeah, knowledge. Get it? Message. Great, great song. Yeah. It's such a powerful Six song. Juice. I got enough to go around, yeah. From the soundtrack of Juice, <clears throat> which is a great film. Yeah. We'd love to cover that one day. <clears throat> um, yeah, we could do a hip-hop special, couldn't we? Yeah, probably have to start a new podcast, but yeah. All right, another one. We'll add that one to the list of podcasts that we'll never start one day. Well, we will. It'll be when the children are grown up. Yeah. So what have you got? 16 years for you? Yeah, about that. Fucking hell. But anyway, uh, he has this wager and he says, look, make it round, then you you get your car back, we'll take the heroin out, you get my wife. But if you fall, then you die. What are you going to do? And he says, well, I'll take the bet. And all the way through this, General the Cat is watching. So the cat is, you know, the cat's eye is seeing all of this happen and unfold. Uh, so he starts the challenge. And he says, now, this, you can see that the ledge here is five, just five inches wide, that's all. Sometimes it's a bit wider. Sometimes it's a bit narrow. It all depends where you are on the building. But basically, if you can make it round, come on. And he starts laughing at him and teasing him. He whips at him with a towel. And he says, I can do what I want. This is my bet, just like the, with the cat across the road. 
and Johnny looks down and he, he's very scared because he's so high up and and Kresner is just laughing at him just like you said like that scene from um the forums is it's got that vibe to it mm. <clears throat> you know it's just basically playing just toying with this guy doesn't expect him to be able to do it he says you, you bastard you can't do this to me then grabs a like a trumpet doesn't he like a squeaky horn thing <laughs> anything to try and put him off he blasts him in the face if you've done it. this to a parody you could be throwing loads of stuff in throwing cats at him and all sorts you know custard pies a uh, big fluffy duster on a really long stick chuck a bag of cocaine in his face he'd well, probably do it actually really mon- well then a load of monkeys <laughs> I don't know where to do that. <laughs> anyway, is anyway, that a monkey sound in your head? Yeah. What's it good. doing? Having a little wank. Oh. That's what monkeys generally do. Have you ever seen the video of the monkey and the frog? No. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, Awful. he's doing sex with the frog, isn't he? Awful. Frog's mouth as well. Poor frog. <laughs> the frog was like, I didn't expect that when the I woke up The worst thing about morning. that video... <laughs> And I urge everybody who's listening to not watch this video. But the worst thing is, is that when the monkey's finished, he throws the frog down, walks off, and the frog, you think, oh, he's killed that frog by, like, basically mouth-raping it. But then the frog sort of rolls over and slowly crawls away, really disturbed. Imagine going back to the lily pad and sort of, hey, it's Jeff the frog. Eric, where you been? Where you been? Uh-oh. You don't want to know. I'm not telling you. You know that monkey? Yeah. Don't go near it. I'm going to have a sore If he throat. looks at you, Days. go in the water. Hop off, mate. Hop off. Hop the fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> um, so, yes. Uh, anyway, I don't know how we got onto that, but uh, monkeys... <laughs> I love that, the fact uh, you gave a parental advisory and a kind of disclaimer for the for viewers pl- or listeners. Please don't ever view the, the frog being Never watch it. Never watch... Werewolf Santa and never watch the frog and the monkey video. As Whatever dub- you do. As a double bill or single bill. <laughs> yeah. If my kids ever come in the room and go, Daddy, Daddy, I just watched the frog and the monkey, I'm going to be very disturbed unless it's some kind of cute Pixar type adventure. Yeah. Anyway, Johnny, uh, the horn drops. Are you saying it as long as there's mouth. mouth- rape in a no, no, d- no. Disney is fine what? no I'm not it okay. sounds like a Disney film the frog and the monkey okay oh okay the frog and the monkey <laughs> just the title not the yeah, concept not the concept brilliant I don't think Disney will make that film probably not well, they're, they're, again they're, they're in financial problems I think aren't they along with a lot of these companies they might start going different ways with their films I don't think Disney have got that Dis- many Disney's, financial problems. Uh, Disney's behind the curtain section. <laughs> got any uh, under the shelf Disney, mate? Yeah, I have actually. Disney what under you, the shelf. What have you got? Snow White does the Seven Little Dwarfs. <laughs> well, Sub- done loads of white. It's called Seven Up. <laughs> She's on Smack. <laughs> Seven Up. Oh no, Smack's brown, isn't it? Coke's white. I wouldn't know. That's the terminology. I wouldn't know. Um, so we watched the horn that he beeped at him fall in slow motion and land on the ground. <laughs> on the ground. And uh, he continues his way around until a bastard little fucker of a penguin, uh, not a penguin, fucking hell, that'd be weird. <laughs> a pigeon just starts going at his ankle. And by going at it, I don't mean it starts humping his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. You'd be really annoyed Get if you were trying me. to do that. The Get fucking off me. Pigeon started going at your ankle. Have you, started... had, have you had many, many a dog hump your leg? Thank God, no. I've never had a dog hump my leg. Never? Oh, yeah. I've had a dog hump my leg a few times. Different what did dogs. you do? Let it finish? Or? Uh, it depends. Uh, if I, if I... <laughs> it depends. <laughs> how many drinks has it bought me? It depends. It is de- it me out depends for how drunk I am. No, um, it depends if the owner's in. there or not. Because if the, well, well, I tried to get try to get off as soon as possible. It hasn't happened for a while. Try to get the dog off as soon as you can. You know, get like a sort of spatula down there, and <laughs> pull it off. But like, it depends if the owner's there. If the owner's there, 
Uh, they're going to do it and get it off pretty quick. But if it's me, it's going to be a bit longer because I'm, I'm going, come on, dog, off you get. If it's a little dog, I'm kicking it off. Yeah. I'm sorry, no, not cruelty to animals, but I'm flicking it off with my leg. But if you've got like a bulldog or something. You know? If it's a fucking XL bully or something like that, I'm just going to be like, you just let me know when you're done, mate. <laughs> Bend over do, you want, go, do you want me to cut up your balls on. for you while you're doing it? Like, can you pass me some tissue? Yeah. Depends on the dog. So there's your answer, guys. If, if you're ever getting humped by a dog... Depends on the size and if the owner's around. You know, there we go. And has it bought you dinner? I wonder, so, yeah, the- I wonder if anyone out there yeah, in human existence Stanchion. has become across a, like, a, a real ferocious like, fucking king of the the beasts around the animals, wherever. Do you know what I mean? Something be- or like a silverback and, gorilla. I, or something. And then it's been like, you know fuck I'm going to be killed to be actually just fucked instead not properly actually fucked but maybe they just rub against them maybe rub against them or something and then they walk away and lived there Mm. must be someone out there who's been fucked by a killer (laughs) (laughs) and lived this is just insanity what is going on I'm just saying there has to be yeah there probably has been there probably has been I'm not uh, the way I'm masquerade saying it, saying to you like you're trying to uh, argue with me in court. There must be. There's like, gonna David be At- one. David Attenborough. I bring out- in witness number two five two. David Attenborough's out there and he's like this gorilla. Do you seems think it happens, David Attenborough? To be attracted to me. <laughs> I'm two choices. I fight it or Suck it. <laughs> Fight it or I let it be. No, he's uh, a dear soul. He's got a new show coming up with the incredible discovery in Devon of the uh, Pliosaurus. I can't remember. I think that's the name. Pliosaurus. Uh, um, no, um, of uh, the head of it. Have you seen it? That's, that's yes, I have, yeah. Incredible. Absolutely. Huge giant dinosaur head mm. found. Anyway, let's carry on. Back to this pigeon. So this pigeon is actually pecking at his ankles, which is not what you need when you're trying to scale around the penthouse flat up high um and he kicks it off and his ankle starts bleeding he says you little fucker he sort of kicks it a bit uh he makes it round to another big ledge and he kicks the pigeon off and there's a bit of a gap on this ledge like a bit of a space where he can sit down and catch his breath Whew, thank god for that but kresner has got a hose and he sees him down there and he blasts him and he says now that was on low power I can put it on the highest power and just blast you off this ledge. Get going. You've got 30 seconds. So he catches his breath for a few seconds and he's doing it again. Um, he makes his way around. He's doing quite well. He gets quite far, but then he slips and he grabs onto an electric cable and sparks start flying and he's swinging and it's, he's turning into a bit of a diehard scenario. Here. He has to climb back up the cable. We keep cutting back to the cat who's just watching it like, yeah. Yeah. Um, he makes it back to the penthouse. He climbs in. He kisses the ground. He says, "I did it. I did it. Thank God." And I love this moment, though. This little horrible moment from this mafia boss. Um, Kresner says, "All right, I'll keep my word. I said you could have my wife and and your car. The heroin's been removed from your car, and here's my wife." And he's got a shopping bag with his wife's head in it, which he rolls out on the floor towards Johnny. Yeah, it's a bit, bit much, really. Oh, okay, now, poor old Johnny. Well, did he deserve that much? He's just it's been humped by a pigeon. On. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, he gets into a fight, um, another little fight here, and uh, the, the cat manages to escape again. This is how the cat always escapes whenever the fight breaks out. Um, Johnny manages to grab a gun. He shoots one of the henchmen. We see the cat run out of the building, runs off. Um, Kresner sort of pleads for his life. He says, I'll give you anything. Money. I can give you this, this. And it keeps going up and up and up until he, he offers him essentially $2 million. And he says, you know, I'm good for it. You know, come on. I, I'm rich. You can be rich. Come on. And obviously he's killed Johnny's love. You know, although they're having an affair, Johnny was in love with this woman. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's have a wager. The ledge. Doom, 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 
So uh, he brings in Rakim and they have to do a battle rap. Oh, that'd be a great ending. Imagine that. You wouldn't win, though. You wouldn't be, you have to you're beat not Rakim. Go, you're not going to win. You'd be so intimidated by Rakim just staring at you rapping at I'd you. I'd just be like, man, you're the best. Um, but anyway, he so they have the bet and he gets out on the ledge and he's going, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he's like, well, come on. You can, you can do it. And he's got the gun, obviously. He's begging for his life. Kresner is scared. Um, we cut down to the cat just running past that horn that dropped from earlier on the sidewalk. And we, we think, oh, that's a bit odd. Why have they showed us that? Well, it's because Kresner slips because the pigeon pecks his feet and he falls to his doom. And we don't see him land, but we hear... Because he lands on the horn and he's dead. <laughs> And that is the end of our segment two, The Ledge. Doom, do, 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 It's the juice, and I got enough to go around. So, we're on to our third and final segment, which is just called General, which is actually where the cat gets its name. Um, it's named by Drew Barrymore in this segment. So, yeah. It jumps on a train. This cat's been all over the place, hasn't it? Yeah. It's been on more holidays than me in the last 10 years, this cat, all over the place. And it's heading to North Carolina. It gets off the train, it jumps into a truck. And we get a little uh, point of view of something approaching Drew Barrymore's family farm. And we think, oh, here's the cat. And then we hear... (laughs) We think, that ain't a fucking cat. What is this? It's Dan in the bushes looking at people. Hello. Um, no, that's not my perfect voice, is it? Do you remember my what perfect voice? What is your perfect voice? Urch, urch, <laughs> Sarah's got a perfect voice. I like to hide in the cupboard and watch. <laughs> oh. Oh. That sounds like Mr. Bean, though. The can, dirty Mr. Bean. Can you send me some of your toenail clippings? Oh. Sarah does a really deep voice one, because it obviously contrasts her voice, and it's just like, ugh, don't, I was like, don't. Talk to me like that. I don't think I'd like to she hear that. Not, just to disclaim it, she doesn't talk to me like <laughs> it in a way like, oh, talk dirty to me. She's in, like, in going, the, when you're in the middle of the act. No, it's not like that. It's just, you know. Good, good. Well, thanks for, um, you know, enlightening us on that, Gav. Um, so, yes. Uh, anyway, it's not a cat. Whatever it is, isn't a cat. But then we do see the cat and because um, the cat attacks this thing or shoes it off, whatever it might be. And it, and then Amanda, played by Drew Barrymore, sees this cat and she says, oh, my God, mummy!" Because she's a little girl. She's eight, nine, whatever she is. She loves cats. She loves animals. Can we keep him, mummy? Can we keep him? No, we're not going to be able to keep him. And then in the end, they, they say, all right, look, if the vet checks him out, because dad's a softy, obviously. Us dads are like that, you know. If the vet checks him out and he's okay, then yes, we can feed him. So... Obviously, the vet checks him out. He's fine. She feeds him some milk later on. And mum's a bit apprehensive. We don't know this animal. She's a bit paranoid. And she says, his name's General. I've named him General. Can he stay in my room tonight? Mum, absolutely not. No, you're not. You're not having the cat in the room. You've got a budgie in the room for a start. Secondly, we don't know where this cat is. It might have rabies. You know, I know the vet's checked it, but I don't want it. So she doesn't let him stay in the room that night. But the next day, the cat is hunting in the garden. And the cat is on its mission because it's been getting these psychic messages from Drew Barrymore all the way through this film. And it knows that there's something out there that's trying to get her. So it's hunting in the garden. Meanwhile, Amanda is watching Tom and Jerry, isn't she? Yeah, I used to like watching Tom and Jerry. I could love Tom and Jerry, dude. You don't get it on anymore, do you? It's not, uh, obviously, it's not allowed, you know. Uh, picked up a DVD of Tom and Jerry uh, at a, jum- a jumble sale in the local village fate last summer. And I uh, put it on for the kids, uh, Elijah, and we watched a few episodes. Me and my sister had, uh, we bought this at the local Woolworths, a three-hour videotape of Woody Woodpecker, Tom and Jerry, yeah, yeah, loads of stuff. Yeah. And it was just brilliant and we used to watch that over and they, over again they're, they're still on amazon prime you can show them to your kids and they'd visually be able to like them all i mean they're very funny okay yeah they're violent and i know that there's some racial connotations as well yeah but your your kids aren't gonna you know, pick up on it yeah and, and i think if you explain to them your kids you know, are too young they're not gonna <laughs> they're not gonna pick up on anything like that. oh dude they do pick up on things trust me we've watched home alone several times 
And my son, <clears throat> Jack, within the first 10 minutes of Home Alone said, his mummy and daddy are, are gone now. And I thought, well, he's already worked out the plot of this film. And then we watched The Snowman, the famous British Christmas 30-minute cartoon. Jack sat and watched it with me. When the end scene sort of came up, when the snowman melts away, he started crying his eyes out. I said, what's the matter? He said, snowman's gone away now. So he, he, although he's only two, he totally gets these things. It's, he's very um, switched on. Yeah, he's, emo he's emotionally very switched on little boy. His sister don't give a shit. Yeah. She doesn't care. <laughs> but, he, but he's like me, man. He's going to be crying at well, everything when he's older, just like me. So anyway, mum is cross because she figures out that... Uh, Amanda let the cat in her room last night, and she is worried about the budgie, like I said. Her dad says to her, the other reason, this is a real dad moment, the other reason, Amanda, is the cat can't sleep in your room because in the night, I've heard that cats steal children's breaths. Every breath you take. Ding, 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 ding. Every move you make. The Rakim version. Can't believe Puff Daddy did that. Oh, he did, didn't he? Yeah. See, Sting let him do that. Oh. Stephen King picks up the phone and he's like, I'm not doing it. Puff Daddy picks up the phone. Yeah, go for it. P did. Oh, P, P Diddle. He's been uh, done for diddling, hasn't he? P, P Diddle did P Diddle 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 P Diddle Diddle, the cat got a fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. Sound like fucking uh, Homer's neighbour, Ned. Yeah, P, P Diddly do. And also Vin Diesel. He's another one that's now... Uh, Been diddling. Sin Diesel, as I like to call him. Not, not kidly diddling, though, are apparently, they? Apparently, he got too fast and too furious with a, a lady at a, uh, a press screening of something. Oh, these celebs think they can get away with it. But anyway, um, so Dad tells Amanda that this cat is going to steal her breath. And he's like, I'm only joking. Or am I? It's like, don't tell your kid that, because kids will believe you. You know... It's a dad thing to do. Anyway, Amanda goes off to school on the bus. Um, and we see her, you know, throughout the day. And she's excited to get home and see General, the cat, at night. Who isn't, apparently, officially allowed in her room still. Um, she, apparently, has been having some bad dreams. Um, and she's been dreaming about a monster living in her wall. Which I think she's been visiting a doctor, a psychologist, about. And Dad says to her, you know, the funny thing is... Since that cat's been here, you haven't had those dreams. She's like, yes, that's because he protects me, Dad. He's been looking after me. So if you let me sleep, let him sleep in my room, I won't have any more bad dreams. So she's got her dad wrapped around her finger, you know. As they all do. Yeah, as they do. So the parents are talking. Um, and the mum says, look, I just don't trust that cat. I don't know why. I just don't want him in her room. I don't want him to eat the budgie, all that kind of stuff. Nighttime. And the cat is trying to get in the room because it's his duty to protect this little girl for whatever reason. And we do hear little noises. <laughs> Sounds like Slimer from the Ghostbusters cartoon. And um, we hear a little sneeze and then a little portal sort of opens up in the wall like a mouse hole. <laughs> Rips open. And a little troll comes out, Gav. Now, what did you think here? Because you have been you've been watching this film. The first segment was dark and twisted, it's paranoia. Yeah, strange Second one. It did feel like is, you know gangster bosses, and then we got this. What? Tell me, how did you feel when you saw the troll? <clears throat> I enjoyed this one, I think, the most because of this little thing, this little monster thing, because it made it feel like a horror movie. The other yeah, two yeah. were more they were horror, but it's more psychological. This was a, a a little monster as a threat and a little girl and they kept trying to protect it. There's a lot more going on here as a story. This so, is the strongest story as on the Twilight Zone. The end story on there is the strongest story, in my opinion. Um, but that's obviously in my opinion also why they are the last stories. I agree. You don't want to go out with fucking <laughs> something limp-wristed. No. Is it a bit that... <laughs> Limp Biscuit. Limp Biscuit. As in a bit just not very, you know, well, strongly handled. 
this segment, because of those things you've just mentioned, a cat, Drew Barrymore, a little supernatural creature, feels very Spielbergian, doesn't it? Um, you know, I suppose it's because Drew Barrymore is in it as well, but it feels a bit poltergeisty, a bit sort of, it's almost a bit like The Gate as well, which I love. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this troll comes out, it climbs up to the budgie, and we don't see it, but it eats the budgie. The, man, the cat manages to come inside the bedroom. Um, the, the troll's climbing up onto the bed, and it is starting to steal Drew Barrymore's breath. It holds her nose. It's great effects, actually. Really good effects. Um, it's obviously a guy in a suit with large props for, for the bits where you don't see it interacting, but it's a good... I don't know how they did it. I guess like a blue screen or something they would have done back then. Um, uh, it looks uh, good. It won't please get be re- a rear view. Um, rear view. Okay. Rear view mirror. Rear screen projection. Yeah. Um, and uh, and obviously just false perspective. The cat manages... It is, it is done re- very well and, and creatively though. Especially when it holds her nose. When you see it pinch her nose, Drew Barrymore's nose yeah. actually looks like it's being pinched. It's good. Um, anyway, the cat manages to scare the troll. The, the troll stabs the cat with its little dagger and wounds it quite badly. It's got a little cut on it. And Amanda wakes up screaming. And obviously this wakes her parents up. The troll runs back into the wall. Parents come in the room. They see that the bird is dead. They see that the window's open. They blame the cat. They see bloody footprints leading out, not knowing that that is the cat's own blood. I know. In this story, it does make you uh, uh, go, oh, mum, you bitch. Just yeah, Leave man. him alone. The cat's, and that's the, the cat's trying to do a good thing. That's the good thing about it. Is that's why it feels quite Spielbergian, because you always get the kids that know what's actually going on and the parents never believe them. And that's, and that's, again, in this story, isn't it? The mum doesn't believe it. The dad is kind of in the middle somewhere. Anyway, the morning um, morning time comes. They're having breakfast. And Drew Barrymore says, look, it wasn't the cat that did it, mum. It was a troll. And dad's like, what? What are you talking about? And he picks up the cat. And he does find a little cut on, on, the, on the cat. And he thinks, well, this wasn't a bird that's cut this. Yeah. So Dad starts he thinking. He does actually have some concerns or surprise that the woman, the mum, was still happy for the cat to be there because I thought she would have kicked it up the arse. Well, you don't know if the mum's going to come around, but she doesn't because she actually then gets some cat food and does the old crate with a stick underneath it uh, to let the cat get caught in a crate. She then drives it over to a clinic, a cat shelter, and says to them, "Yeah, get this cat put down, please. Thanks very much." Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So Amanda's there at night going, General, General, come and get your milk. General's not coming because he's, he's about to uh, take his last walk. Dead man walking. Dead cat walking. Yep. Christopher walking. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher walking. Christopher walking. <laughs> um, now, it's night time. There's no one to protect her. She's asleep in bed. The troll comes out of the wall. The troll looks over to the window and thinks, brilliant, the window's shut. The cat's not coming in this time. I'll finish the job of stealing this child's breath. So he uh, makes his way over to the bed. It's great um, giant props that they've got set up, big dollies and books and building blocks and things. It looks great. And um, it climbs up onto the bed. It blocks the door very cleverly using a door stop. And turning it around the other way so the parents wouldn't be able to get in. Uh, fuck off. Fuck off. If my child's <clears throat> in a room, there's a plastic fucking door stop, the only thing stop that door. I am getting in that door if my child is crying. I don't care if a little goblin's puts out there. It would not stop me. I mean, I've tried to get in my front door sometimes when there's been an Amazon parcel delivered and it's jammed under the door I, I can't get in so my kids are fucked we're gonna we're gonna have to have a <laughs> we're gonna have to have a door door competition and see if we can get in so, come on let's do it me you and jack nicholson when he was in his form in the shining who's gonna who can break down the door first i think jack's gonna win that one yeah probably so um the troll starts stealing amanda's breath by pinching her nose and you see this effect of her breath being sucked into the troll it's like almost like a drug for it the cat, though, manages to break into the window and it fights the troll because it's escaped, by the way. The cat escaped. It fights the troll. Uh, they have a big old meow, meow, and the troll jumps onto a helium balloon and it sort of floated up to the ceiling and then 
it's floating back down and the cat's attacking it and uh, Amanda's going get him get him general get him um and the cat manages to flick the troll into a fan as in a spinning fan yeah it's quite good <laughs> i'm glad um, that the that comes out at the end of them going oh there's a little arm well yeah because they come in they break the door down they go in they find the dagger first of all then they find an actual arm and a little bell and they think fuck me there really was a monster which is cool because these sort of movies they they never really you never get that really do apart from et and stuff you don't really ever get the parents find out the truth yeah they always just think it was all a delusion they do find a really little knife as well yeah, the little dagger. Um, they see the hole in the wall, and she says, that's where he kept coming out. So, of course, they let her keep the cat, but they also say, we will let you keep the cat if you promise to never, ever, ever, ever tell anybody about this troll thing, because you're going to sound crazy, and we are too. So they do, and we get um, yeah, one the, final... David, see, if we had the internet and social media, they could be all over it on YouTube, making money off it and all sorts. Troll, I find this little troll's hand, yeah. and uh, then the cat just licks Drew's mouth. And it ends. Well, it, it eats a fish, it's very happy, and then, yeah, you then think, Is the cat gonna steal her breath? I think they're trying to sort of give you a bit of a red herring at the end here, but then all it does is lick her nose, and she wakes up and goes, Hey, General, and that's the end. A colorful fish, a red herring, colorful fish, fake fish, that's what you called it. That's fake time. fish, that's it. For anyone who doesn't know or didn't hear, there was an episode a long time ago, years ago, where Gav was trying to remember the phrase red herring as we were describing the plot of a film. He said, and this is a complete fake fish, isn't it? And I said, what? It happens sometimes. You know, a fake fish. And I said, do you mean a red herring? Yeah. I can't help it. It just happens. We love you. We love you for it. Mm. Still a surprise 10 years of talking to people, considering they weird. We've all said weird... I've said weird stuff. I've told stories on here that I probably shouldn't have told. I say words that don't exist. I've told people about me shitting myself. You've said loads of stories, and every time you go, oh, I shouldn't say this, but I suppose they probably don't listen. As soon as I start doing that... And I always start egging you on. As soon as I say, oh, I shouldn't really tell this story, you always... Your eyes pop out your head like, go on, I know you're going to. It's always enjoyable, that's why. So that was Cat's Eye from 1985... Um, it is uh, a lesser talked about, lesser seen of the anthologies, but it is a Stephen King one. Fans of Stephen King will probably have seen it. It's got James Wood, Drew Barrymore in it. It's got some good effects. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, let's talk about. Let put them in order, Gav. What's the order of your top? You know, your three best to worst stories here. Uh, best. So number one is General. Uh, uh, no, let's go the other way round. So I'll okay. go worst right. to best. So um, <clears throat> I'd probably go the uh, ledge, then the cigarettes, then the uh, Drew Barrymore. And I'm I'm with you all the way on those. Uh, and and I find the film is okay. Would I uh, do I recommend it? Um, if you like horror and you want something simple of on a Sunday afternoon, maybe. It's very. It feels very TV series doesn't it it feels like these could have been episodes of twilight zone or something yeah there's 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 background apologies as an adult i actually recognize that the the smoking story is actually the darkest of all of them and, and actually probably or well, in some ways the scariest yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's very it but, um, real, real life the whole but with my nostalgia goggles on yeah it's still going to be the same order that you put them in yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it's fun so You'd, to somebody who hadn't seen it, you would recommend uh, it. But... Maybe if you're into horror movies. If you don't like horror movies, don't bother. But like, don't don't go. Oh, Friday night, let's get a pizza and watch that. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I've obviously got my nostalgia glasses on for this one. Um, I saw it the, the end of it anyway at a younger age. Um, but I, I do love it. I love it. Um, the middle bit isn't as good, but the first story and the last story are fantastic. There is the reason it falls apart for me is with a reviewer's eye is there isn't really the, the cat doesn't really tie these stories because together that bit wasn't filmed or was cut out or what yeah no. we the cat's really only relevant in the third story um i suppose it's in the electrocution chamber in the first one but he could have put anything in there chicken i don't know dog humping gaff's leg but um i don't know 
but yeah I, I still recommend it i think if you haven't seen it me in the corner of the white eyes of fierce with like a bulldog humping me and me going i'm not moving i'm not moving if you have a cigarette dan we will send in a second dog God. even hornier for the other leg <laughs> oh. then we send the third i've only got two legs oh, oh boy and then we'll send the monkey in with the frog um but yeah, I would if you haven't seen this. Look, it's like it's, it's like it's like it's like a primeval like sex toy. <laughs> but listen, if you if you haven't seen this, it's Stephen King who's written it. You know, you, you'll know the director, and it's got James Woods in it. That opening segment is really dark. Things get a little bit lighter after that, and it ends on almost a bit of a children's um story at the end but i would recommend it and it's definitely a thumbs up from me oh, i've just had a horrible fall i bet oh, someone's done do you that, want to share it no i bet someone's what, done have a frog probably yeah yeah let's get off that for everything you can think of someone's done it well, that's the worst world. thing isn't it yeah awful isn't it but anyway that's enough about cat's eyes and frog's mouths um right talking of awful things happening with animals and other things bill murray you're here you're ready to take us into World of the Strange. Oh, Bill, is that a frog? What's that he got? What's he got? He says it's a toad. Oh, it's his acid toad. Yeah. What are you going to do? Lick the back of it? I don't, oh. want, I don't want to hang out with Bill Murray on acid. Can you imagine? All over the place. Well, Bill Murray, it's time for World of the Strange, so if you could please take it away. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. World of the Strange. World of the Strange. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Billy Billy. Billy Boy. Billy Murray. Um, yep. Well, put the frog down. This is going to be a little bit of a conversation here. It's kind of a list. It's kind of a list. Um, you gives him ideas now, don't you? No, because... Yeah, I know, frog. Um, because we... And the next one we're covering this episode is the Twilight Zone movie, which has one of the most infamous deaths on a film set in Hollywood history, in film history, probably. Uh, because of that, I have a list of deaths, either on camera or on set, um... Uh, and related to that that have happened over the last many many years in filmmaking this is probably another little trigger warning because there's going to be some description of injury uh and some of it m happens to children as well have you got a one in the 20s where there's just the three people drowned because they just let the water go down uh, I don't think that one's on this one, no. Oh, right, that's crazy. God, imagine... Yeah, but things were so different a hundred odd years ago. Just water massive mountain and three people drowned. It's surprising that people like Jackie Chan are still around because he legitimately, as you know, does all of his own stunts and so do a lot of the Hong Kong stuntmen. And, well, you do get stuntmen who aren't here, so... For well, that's reasons. true. Yeah. But someone like Jackie Chan, you know, I know they do loads and loads of mm. testing and... Uh, uh, he uh, he obviously has an eye for where his body needs to be at a certain point and can get to that point. So I think he probably actually has advantage over uh, average stuntman. Well, if we start with Jackie, I suppose because but he does more more probably is what you're saying. Well, let, let's start with him. Although he's obviously still alive, one of my biggest heroes. Um, there was a time he was filming a movie called Armor of God in the mid '80s, which was his homage to Spielberg's. Indiana Jones movies it's about a character called Asian Hawk who hunts for treasure around the world and he was in Yugoslavia as it used to be called filming and he had to do a scene where he jumped from a wall probably about 20 feet onto a tree and he had to grab the branch of the tree swing with his own momentum then flip off the branch and land <laughs> and he did that he did about four takes of it <clears throat> wasn't happy because Jackie Chan's a perfectionist he wasn't happy with it you might not know this story Gab so this might be interesting for you um, so he decided to do another take and this was a mistake because the last four takes had weakened the branch 
so he says i want one more because obviously he directs all of his own stuff he choreographs all of his own stuff he's the one man show you know so he gets back up on the wall he jumps off the wall swings onto the branch the branch snaps he falls about 20 feet and lands on a rock which punctures his skull oh my god blood immediately squirts out of his ear which is not a good sign and they're in the middle of the mountains in Yugoslavia. What do they do? They've got the world's biggest action star, potentially, at the time, who's got a rock embedded in the back of his skull. But they manage to get a doctor to fly out and meet them at a hospital nearby. Jackie Chan undergoes brain surgery. Because of that, he has a metal plate in the back of his head, which I have felt, because I've met him. <laughs> few times uh, and when he hums or sings it vibrates and he demonstrated this to me and a few other people i had to put my finger on in his hair on the back of his head and he goes um, and you can feel this little vibrating part of his head on, which is uh, mental hang on, hang on hang on stop stop shh right, I, did you not know about well, this i never realized that t- today i would be chatting doing a podcast uh, where, and my co-host would be telling me about a, a celebrity where he's rubbed the back of his metal plated head while he hums <laughs> to him jackie hummed to me i didn't hum to him no, i know that it, yes the celebrity hummed away and you felt the head for, back of his head his metal plate it's i sent not, you that it's picture not the, it's, i've not heard it on a podcast before I'll i sent you. you that picture didn't i the other day of me and him that i dug out yeah um I met him five times over the course of one year, actually. Four in Hong Kong, once in London. Very Until the restraining order was taken out. <laughs> yeah, it's a long story, which I, I might tell on the podcast sometime. But um, for now, anyway. So, yeah, because of that, he has a metal plate in the back of his head. He also has um, quite a lot of hearing loss in one ear. But just goes to show you, even with lots and lots of checks, you can things can still go wrong, as we know because we're covering Twilight Zone the movie but also that is a whole story into itself so I'm going to begin to work my way down this list of stories and things that have happened on set so some of these will shock you and I don't just mean you Gav I mean you listeners and some of these will just make you think how can that have happened don't forget some of these things happened so that laws could be brought in things change we only ever improve and if we don't know that something's wrong or, or shouldn't be done we don't know but um, also, some of these happened a long time ago. Like, I've just described this thing that happened in the 20s with people drowning. Back then, it just kind of happened, sadly. <clears throat> but moving from Jackie Chan on to... Uh, it, it, it's just very quickly. It's not we've gained knowledge of how to not die. We already knew that. <laughs> we just didn't give a fuck <clears throat> and care about human life. Yeah. That's the issue. Until they started getting charged and they'd be sent to prison, they went, oh... All right. Well, that ties nicely into our first one, um, which is Brandon Lee. We've covered The Crow. It's a fantastic film. But obviously, Brandon Lee was killed towards the end of the production of The Crow movie. Um, He was basically on set a day when the weapons handler wasn't on set. And he was supposed to be stabbed with a fake knife. It was his... Um, death scene that they were filming before being thrown out of the window they'd done most of the shot but the director wasn't happy with it and he said they wanted to try something different he said why don't we try you being shot instead so they did a couple of takes of this one of those is in the film they ever they did one shot though sadly where um they'd forgotten to take out the old dummy rounds from the previous shot uh, so it actually fired an old dummy round, like a, like a bullet, basically, with the speed of a bullet into Brandon Lee's stomach, which then, um, I think it uh, severed his spine, ruptured his stomach, and he was rushed to hospital, but was announced dead on arrival at hospital. And that shocked people because everybody knew Bruce Lee's son. He was making a name for himself. This Crow movie, it was going to be well, huge and was, it was huge. It, it, just that whole idea of Bruce Lee making one film 
Enter the Dragon that was very, very opened up a whole new world for him. Uh, um, and it being very successful to then pass away after that, you know. And like with Crow, the Crow <clears throat> made Brandon Lee very well known and uh, passed away after that. And it makes the film, and we talked about this, so I won't go over it too much, but it makes the film that much more emotional because you know that he died making this. And it's a great legacy to leave behind. But yeah, it, it also. It, it's a crazy thing when an actual <clears throat> actor has passed away, like Podcast Free, that sort or of thing. Heath, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. Yeah, and um, I was an extra in that film. Yeah. I, um, I like to throw that in there. But, but this, what this did was, obviously, it changed, it changed the laws. The weapons handler has to be on set at all times. Well, well um, again, that should just be fucking obvious. But it wasn't at the time because, and we'll come to this when we discuss the Twilight Zone movie, the directors had and ha- still have a certain amount of power that they probably shouldn't have. Yeah, so, no, so it was <clears> obvious <throat> still then. They just uh, d- decided to look the other way. Yeah. So because of that, the- Brandon is no longer with us. Um, but they also brought in a new law um, written specifically for this, so that his legacy is also that he's, to some extent, protecting other actors after his death. But yes, so we all know about that one. Um, and, and you've got to say, though, about how that's still, like, recently with the Baldwin shooting. I don't well, know. that's one of the things on my list. Um, um, like, so it we'll, still we'll, happens, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess I guess it's going to. Uh, uh, it, it's is every once in a while going to happen if you got a firearm. Whether it's yeah, every so many years, it's probably going to happen. Well, let's talk about that now then. I guess um, so. Yes, Alec Baldwin on the set of the movie A Western in 2021, a film called Rust. He was rehearsing a scene where his character points a gun towards the camera. But he accidentally pulled the trigger. There were three people behind the camera. So this is a rehearsal. Two of the people got hit. Uh, Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was hit in the chest. She died on her way to hospital. Uh, And the director, Joel Swayze, was injured in his shoulder. Yeah. It's still kind of being looked at, really. So I don't really... Probably can't (sighs) even talk about it that much, but it's at one point he was let off you know but now he might still be being charged with involuntary manslaughter it wasn't weird it was very weird though because like two weeks after that happened he was literally three miles up the road from me doing a live instagram thing walking around road going i wonder what sort of people live around here it was so bizarre and people I remember like, that yeah like what, what, why is he just like now in England filming another movie because we've got a studio not far from here filming something and it's like what the fuck like really as it stands he was he has been cleared of involuntary manslaughter charges however it's still being investigated to some extent <laughs> he still is called in for questioning from time to time and they are looking at how this could have happened and basically another law has been brought in which is even during a rehearsal actors aren't allowed to handle guns things like that you know it's all gotta it's gotta be safe it's gotta be really safe man you can't you can't do these sort of things talking to guns i'll move on to my next story an actor that no one would have heard of him sadly called john eric hexham um but he was 26 when he died. He um, starred in something called Cover Up, which is a, an American action show. Uh, he was very, he was going to be a big thing in the early 80s. And in 1984, October, um, they were getting behind with their shooting schedule and everyone was under pressure. And he was told look there's going to be he was told by the director they were all sort of standing around and he he was told there's going to be a few more days on this i know we were supposed to have wrapped by now i'm really sorry and he sort of joked can you believe this crap and he pulled his gun out of his holster put it to his head and pulled the trigger like what do you think happened gav oh for god's sake yeah so it wasn't loaded with real bullets but because he put it to the side of his head, the dummy bullet hit with enough force yeah, of that, course. 
that his bone bone fragments lodged in his brain. He had a severe hemorrhaging. He was rushed to the Beverly Hills Medical Center. They operated on his on his brain for five hours. <clears throat> he went into a coma, and then six days later, they pronounced him brain dead, and they turned off the life support machines. Fuck it all. Imagine that moment where he thought it'd be fun if I did that. He was probably trying to lighten the mood. He thought if I do this, it'll be funny, but he wasn't thinking. And again, this is why these these are actors are under pressure. You know, they're making these movies where they've got to remember these lines, this action, this dialogue, this you know, fight scenes, and all this stuff. Don't give them a, a live gun. They were probably on cocaine in the eighties. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying this guy was, but that story is just awful, really. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, let's go swing it back round to the Dark Knight. Because, as we, as you may or may not remember, somebody died making it, and it wasn't Heath Ledger. Um, a stunt performer called Conway White, uh, Wycliffe died. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, he was rehearsing, again, a rehearsal. One of the cars, um, one of the car chases in the films, and it's where it's the scene where the Batmobile gets blown up, um, and he was leaning out of the passenger car window filming a, another car. So this guy was just filming um, another car as it ran parallel to him, but his fellow stunt driver missed the turning at the end of the track. Their vehicles collided with each other, and then with a tree, and he it was died instantly. I'm assuming he was probably if not beheaded, then had severe trauma because he's leaning out of a really fast-moving car holding a camera with another car inches from them and then they both hit each other and then hit a tree. So it's probably not going to yeah, be... that's just... Yeah, that's terrible. Um, it, <sighs> I, it's one of those things, though, like, it's, especially as a camera person, as I've filmed things before... Uh, it's the case of oh quickly grab that uh, and something's happening you know it'd be good for a camera <clears throat> and you for, kind of forget what you're doing or where you are and you get so caught cool in the moment of making sure it's in focus and in camera and you're filming it that then you stop and you're like oh my back's killing me like, everything comes back it dawns do you know what I mean mm. um, so yeah I guess getting really carried away and just leaning out it makes you think how did some of these guerrilla movies get made in the well, you just got 80s, to watch that know? Australian uh, uh, out uh, movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This is, is an Oz, 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 exploitation. Oz exploitation. This isn't Hollywood or whatever. Yeah, um, I was very safe on that that Batman film. I was a prisoner in the boat. So you were cuffed up. Just sat around think. on a, a lot uh, on Palmer Studios. Good. So you, you weren't hanging out studio. of a moving vehicle or anything like that. Then? No, I just sat there. <laughs> the most dangerous thing I had to do is take my glasses off. So I couldn't see very well. That is pretty... You're like Daphne from Scooby-Doo when you take your glasses off. Or Velma, I should say. Yeah. Jinkies, Dan, I can't find my glasses. They're not as bad anymore. As I've got older, my eyes thought it was getting better. Yeah, which is one of those weird things. Same here. When was the last time you saw me wearing glasses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, My, um... I can, like... I have to put paper, like... (laughs) I can see, like, quite well now. I can actually probably watch a movie with a big enough screen TV without the glasses if I'm not too far away. I used to wear them just for work but, mm. and work watching movies, but I don't wear them anymore because... I've had I, them since I was 12. That's weird. I've only had glasses for about 15 years. But my, my eyesight was getting better. It's very weird. Apparently it does get better as you get older. Yeah. It's like... Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to our next movie, which is Midnight Rider. Probably haven't heard of this because they never finished making it. It was an unfinished biopic about a blues musician called Greg Alman. They only managed to do one day of filming in 2014 because a terrible thing happened and which ended the production there and then on the first day. Is this on a train track? Yes. So the cast and crew had begun filming a dream sequence where William Hurt, who's passed away himself now, uh, lay on a metal bed on a railway bridge on the actual tracks over the at uh, the Altahama River in Georgia now fuck knows what they were thinking they obviously hadn't checked anything out but as they were filming they realised that a freight train was coming down the tracks at them 
at a very high speed. Now, you'd think they would look at schedules or get the track shut off. Uh, a producer fucked up. Well, basically, they couldn't do much about it. They all managed to, to try and get to safety, but several of the crew were injured. Um, obviously, William Hurt got off the bed because he lived for many years after that, but the train hit the metal bed um, and parts of metal were fired everywhere. One of the pieces of metal and shrapnel impaled camera assistant Sarah Jones. Shit. Not only did it impale her, Gab, it flew her into the train and she was toast. So she was impaled and then the force of her being impaled javelin like turned to the front of the train. Thing. It is, man. And she died instantly. Oh my God. There wouldn't have been a lot left. Have you seen a, an American freight train? Uh, uh, and who, was a, who went down for this? Who went into prison? They just stopped production. Not, I don't have any more to the story. <sighs> You're right. Someone's fucked up there. For absolutely because uh, that that is like stand by me but real do you know what i mean it, they're, they're crossing it, the bridge it's gonna go back to the whole thing of no one actually accountable because of so many departments which we're gonna see and be speaking about it's pretty crazy hmm. here's a movie from the 80s a very famous 80s movie that no one talks about a tragedy that happened within it but that would that is top gun Everybody knows Top Gun. It's got these incredible aerobatic stunts and flight sequences. We'd never seen anything like it because it was all real. They are real pilots doing this. However, sadly, uh, during a uh, filming of one of these stunts, um, um, one of the pilots called Art Scholl failed to recover from a spin. So he's doing like a crazy spin in the plane. Quite and he couldn't, couldn't get control of the plane and it crashed into the Pacific Ocean. And to this day, they've never found the plane or the pilot. So it's a fucking... It's a person in an aeroplane just... Somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. What the fuck? And because of that, they were never, ever, ever able to determine the cause of the crash. Probably gone to a pool to another land. Bermuda Triangle ship. Aliens. But because of that, obviously, Top Gun was dedicated to Art Scholl's memory. But people don't talk about that. People don't realise that, you know, that, that a man died. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, right. Well, let's uh, move on. And, and not finding and recovering the the, the, the aeroplane and shit is, is even crazier. Well, let's move on from Tom Cruise to Daniel Radcliffe. You're wondering where I'm going with this, aren't you? No. Well, there was a stunt performer called David Holmes, who was... Not John Holmes. No, David Holmes. He was Daniel Radcliffe's stunt double for the first six Harry Potter films. Mm. Was. He was testing a stunt... Uh, a cunt sequence, I was going to say. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different Harry Potter movie, isn't it? That is a chamber of secrets, that is. That is. Slip in my chamber of secrets. <laughs> Look at my philosopher's stone. Oh, I don't know the. I can't. I don't know the names, so I can't do it. Do you want to be the prisoner of my Azkaban? I guess so. Um, Holmes was testing. So uh, David Holmes was testing Azkaban. He was testing a stunt sequence on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One. This stunt sequence is called a jerk back, where you have an explosion go off which is added later with effects and then the stunt person is on a, um, a cable which jerks them back yeah to imitate the effects of the blast okay. you've seen it a million times yeah however uh holmes was slammed into a wall after being jerked back landed on a crash mat underneath and his neck was broken instantly oh god <clears throat> what the force of the jerk Yes, he actually didn't die, do apologise, but he is completely paralysed from the neck down and is a wheelchair user. Oh, he's not dead, right. But, but, shit. I bet, but he, I bet he got compensated. He does a podcast with Daniel Radcliffe now called, get this, Cunning Stunts, in which they discuss and interview stunt performers from around the movie industry. So he's kind of... Making it in, as you will is correct. Yeah. yeah. But I love that name as well. Welcome to another episode of Cunning Stunts. How many times do you think they've said that and got it wrong? 
I don't know if it's weird, but I've thought of these things before. If I was paralysed or if I was fucked up, what I'd do. I'd already planned <laughs> in Jesus my head Christ. what I'd do. I'd be like, well, I'd do a writer if I was in that situation. If that situation, I could be an artist. I've thought of most things, even being deaf or blind, how I could still be creative. I don't well, know why. If you like, were paralysed, Cap, don't worry. There's I'd lots look of things I could do. I'd look after you in a snowy cottage and I'd, I'd get, get to write a book for me. I'd get fucking like a super buff out like, like, like Joe and Family Guy. Yeah. That guy in um, Boys in the Hood in the wheelchair, he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. his upper body is yeah. like the I, whole. I'd wear it? football sh- sh- shirts like him as well. Be Ricky. <laughs> He's the guy that I'd want to fight the least, the guy in the wheelchair, because he is so hench. Yeah. He can pump those wheels so fast, he'd catch me. Boom. I'd do other things well if I was in a wheelchair. Like, I'd do, like, so many, so many things. Like, fancy dress be well good. This year, I'm, I'm fucking going as fucking... <laughs> this year's well good. Fucking hell. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Jesus I'm going to be Christ. Francis. Is it Francis? Next year, I'm going as a Dalek. But now, cause it, now I'm going Friday the 13th Part 2. It's, it's all right. There's a, there's a few people in wheelchairs out there, which, you know... Oh, there are, yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> Some of them might be listening. <laughs> if you are listening and you are in a wheelchair, guys, have you ever dressed up as anyone from Friday the 13th Part 2 or Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Um, yeah. I've actually seen... Franklin! I've actually seen... Um, there's a guy in, who's with one leg... Um, and that he's got like an Instagram of every year he dresses up as something amazing that he incorporates with like one of them he's a, a flamingo and he stands upside down with his crutches and his foot is the flamingo's head nice. and it's just incredible this guy's so See? creative he got to be creative in your situation <clears throat> well talking of flamingos and other animals let's move on to Australia where we're going to discuss something that was caught on film that will never be seen um, because they destroyed the footage and I'm talking about Steve Irwin uh, the, croc- the crocodile hunter everybody loved him you know he was he loved animals they seemed to love him apart from this one stingray mm. yeah um, in 2006 him and his crew were filming a documentary about the Great Barrier Reef and all the animals that live within it and all the nature that goes on around it and him and his cameraman Justin Lyons went uh, in a small raft into shallow waters and they encountered get this an eight foot wide stingray that is phenomenal that's massive eight foot wide stingray why did he get near he got he got the boat as close as he could. He said, I've got to see this thing swimming away. We've got to capture the ma- majesty of this thing swimming away. But instead of moving along, the stingray took this as a threat. And it attacked him, um, mistaking his shadow, because it would have only had his shadow looming over him, for one of its predators. It probably thought he was a tiger shark, which was one of its natural predators. Stingrays, though, they don't just... So they've got a barb on the end of their tail... They don't just stab you once with it. They can do around 100 strikes a second. How? Like like a needle, like a tattoo needle? Yeah, like a tattoo needle. Whoa. So it did this to Steve Irwin and caught him right in the heart by chance, which which also delivered a fatal dose of venom into his heart. Direct. And he was left lying there with a two inch, two inch wide gash over his heart, which was full of venom. He died not long after, a few hours later, and he was only forty four years old. That was crazy. Yeah. I was in Australia that time yeah. um, because we were going to his zoo in Australia, and he died while I was there. And I thought, bloody hell, it's crazy. I still went to the zoo. Obviously, he wasn't there. <laughs> and at least you weren't there beforehand rubbing his head and he was humming to you oh. I love the fact that we've got connections to the stories tonight <laughs> I don't know, it's just weird isn't it I don't have a connection to the next story yeah. other than that you and I are British I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a story in there because I, yes. I bet you haven't done it but it's not um, accidental it, well it is accidental, it didn't mean to happen but it's not a cause of um, you know like someone having a bullet in the gun or whatever uh, it's Tommy Cooper that is my next story 
No way. Yeah. Oh, there, you do it. <laughs> that is the next one. That's what I was saying. The next one, I do have a connection to, well, only that I'm British and so are you. So for anybody outside of the UK, Tommy Cooper was a very um, big British comedian, magician, entertainer. Very strange man in that he... Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've seen it. Um, Weird. He would, he would come on stage and he, he had catchphrases and he would... Do, he would do some magic. He wore a red fez on his head, and he was a very odd character, like one of those characters, like Jimmy Savile. Not that he was dodgy, but one of those characters that could only really be in Britain in the in the eighties, really. Um, and he's appearing on Live from Her Majesty's in nineteen eighty four, which was a variety show uh, at her L- London's um, theatre called Her Majesty's Theatre. But it was being broadcast live. Now my dad watched this live. He was a big Tommy Cooper fan. He remembers it. His performance began with him doing his whole... Imagine like, that, though. You don't have the internet. You can <laughs> watch it and be like, what's happened? So, yeah, he, he started performing his magical stuff that he did, which is where he wears a big gown, and then he brings Face objects out of his gown. And um, it's obviously been passed to him through the curtain coming out of his cloak. But it's all very funny stuff, you know. Uh, and then it was supposed to be a bit where... Jimmy Tarbuck, the host, was supposed to pop out of the curtain and you'd sort of see him handing a ladder to him, which would kind of give the gag away. It was supposed to all sort of happen. But it didn't get to that point in the gag because um, he started acting a little off and went a little pale. And they sent a lady out, a female assistant came on stage to check on him and make sure that he knew what his next bits were that he's going to do. When this lady came out on stage, he clutched his chest and fell to the ground and everybody thought oh he's acting like he's in love or something you know and he sort of fell down and the curtains quickly closed over him and kind of pulled him in a bit pulled him inside and it turns out he suffered a massive heart attack live on television just dropped dead and you can see it on youtube if you're really Um, so inclined he he died in the ambulance on the way to hospitals at the age of 63 Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. My, like I said, my dad... Um, it's all live. Crazy. Well, I expect... Uh, I've asked my folks probably did as well, because back in the day, wasn't much on telly. Everybody watched the same shit. Yeah. Imagine going into work the next day to discuss that. Blimey. Something to talk about, I suppose. <clears throat> well, I've got three more, um, and then we're done. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting topic, and quite mind-blowing at the time so there's another another one to talk about here then um i don't know if you remember a show called sliders science fiction show no. about people who jump through different dimensions what, it's on what? bbc2 in the uk okay. in the 90s 96 jonathan reese davies was in it jerry o'connell um and there was a 27 year old actor in it called ken steadman who was in it from time to time with a guest starring role um he had been in nypd blue baywatch he was kind of trying to make a name for himself um and in this one scene him and one of his uh, female colleague actors uh were in a dune buggy driving along um i think it had to be a bit of a tough guy in this it was all set on a desert planet this scene and the vehicle had seat belts however him and his f- uh, lady colleague forgot to fasten their seat belts they did the scene but they lost control of the dune buggy it completely flipped over now the lady walked away with two cuts and one bruise but he died instantly his head was completely crushed all because they'd forgotten to fasten seatbelts again they're making a tv show they might not have the budget the production the slickness of a hollywood film they wouldn't have anybody there to go have you got your seatbelts on which sounds like a silly thing to say yeah but it would have potentially saved his life. Yeah. Going all the way back to 1923, and this isn't the one that you talked about earlier, this is a lady called Martha Mansfield. She was making a film called The Warrens of Virginia, which was a Civil War set romance about a soldier who falls in love with a Southern woman. And they got through the entire movie and the last shot they got the last shot brilliant fantastic everyone was happy with that she was so happy to have finished filming she still had her costume on she jumped in the car with her friends 
um, which were nearby, and they all just decided to celebrate with a cigarette. However, her costume was highly flammable. Oh, shit. And as soon as the the match was lit, she was completely engulfed in flames. She managed to jump out of the car and roll around, and her, co- her male... Stop, stop, drop, and roll. <clears throat> yep. Her male colleague, actor, buddy, threw his coat on her and tried to put her out. Um, they did put the fire out, but she was rushed to a nearby hospital and sadly died uh, within a couple of hours of severe burns all over her body. Oh, God, the pain. Again, as soon as you cut these days, you get them out of the, the costume, you get them out of the makeup, the prosthetics, whatever it is. You get them safely away from the set. And why was it so flammable? Because 1923. But what? what why? What, what um, purpose does that show for the film? It would have just been the material used in the... You think of the eighties with the shell suit. Yeah, that thing went up like a bloody. Do you know what I mean? So there we go. And this last one is possibly one of the most shocking. Um, there is a. I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the one about Deadpool two, but just even as recent as Deadpool two, a stunt actor was killed by driving his motorcycle through a glass window. It all went completely wrong. But the last one I'm going to talk about is involving John Wayne. 1956 okay. John Wayne made a movie called The Conqueror where he played um, uh, Genghis Khan so a bit bad really because he's an American guy playing a Mongolian guy so forget that kind of thing yeah, it, it, it happened but um, the movie has quite a deadly legacy because it was filmed in Utah Utah Saints you, you, you. Utah and it was filmed within spitting distance of a nuclear weapons test site. Yeah. Now. Yes, radiation. 91 crew members developed cancer over the following years. Wow. 46 of them, including John Wayne himself, died from stomach cancer at the age of... He was 72 when he died. And they put it all down to spending months filming downwind from this nuclear test site because 91 people and got cancer. Is that a film site that can be seen? Yeah, yeah. It's, wow. it's called The Conqueror, 1956, The Conqueror. Oh, dear, oh dear. But 91 people, and obviously it wasn't instant, but they've realised over the years these people were all ca- catching. <laughs> you don't catch cancer. These people were getting cancer because they'd been filming down, downwind of this nuclear test site. It's just insane, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty bad. And well, the I... trouble is, though, it's the same thing again, though. If a worker goes, Oi, Barry, don't know if we should be working so close to a radiation site up there. I know, but what we could do about it, yeah, right. You want to keep your job, don't you? You know. And back then as well, people weren't educated enough to probably know that you can get cancer if you're around radioactive substances. Hmm. Well, that leads us on to Vic Morrow. Mm. Now, we can discuss this in this segment, or we can discuss this when we get to the main review. Well, I'd say do it when we get to it. (laughs) Let's do that then. So, yeah, Vic Morrow, Twilight Zone, the movie, we will discuss that during the review. But, sorry that was a bit of a downbeat one, Gav. Yeah. Um, But I think it's interesting to discuss that how, just how inept film sets can be at times. Um, Yeah. Well, yeah, we, that, we we will we're going to have this discussion again in a moment. So, yeah, and not just film sets. You know, some of these weren't accidents. Some of these were a heart attack or a stingray that just so happened to attack well, someone. Uh, and in the workplace, these uh, things happen. I believe um, Sigmund and whatever they're called, the guys with the white tiger in Vegas, but didn't one of them get eaten by the tiger in front of an audience? Uh, something like that. Yeah, so these things happen, crazy times. But Bill, you're looking sad over there. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. You've got through all the movies you've made, Ghostbusters. I'm going to say, though, if you ever come to me... Sorry, Bill, hang on. If you ever come to me and you say, like, I've got us a gig, uh, we're going to wear white suits and uh, have a white tiger on a podium and we're going to, like, perform with it, I'll secondly be scared of what the performance is. Firstly, I'm going to say no. 
We shouldn't, Gav, we shouldn't do that with, with animals of such calibre. Gav, I've got us a gig in white suits, but it's not with a tiger. It's with a frog and a monkey. <laughs> do we do a live commentary? <laughs> no. no, they do a live commentary on us. The, the frog and the monkey. I'm the frog. I'm the monkey. No, no, you're the frog. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the frog. I don't want to be the frog. Are you saying you want to be the monkey? Oh. I don't want to be either of them. Look, Bill, it's gone crazy. Take us out of here, please. That's all the time we've got for this week on World Was Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. Dante and Steven Spielberg take you to another dimension. The Twilight Zone from 1983. Four horror and science fiction segments directed by four famous directors. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> what else could be done by directors by four famous, not directors, uh, each of them being a new version of a classic story from Rod Sterling's landmark television series. That's a terrible yeah. right up there. Um, but basically, it's four stories uh, of the original TV show redone by uh, directors who were big uh, at the year of 84. 83. 83. Yes, um... Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, George Miller, and of course, what was the other director guy? John Landis. John Landis. So we're we're going to get into that now, aren't we? Um, He's a very friendly person. He is. <laughs> Just don't go near a helicopter if he's around. Um. Yeah, so let's. I guess the first thing to do really is just talk, talk about, about the Twilight Zone. What yeah. the what the Twilight Zone is, and then we'll get what we're going to do. Then, guys, the way that we're going to break this down into three bits. I'm going to do a very brief history of what the Twilight Zone is for anybody who doesn't know or anybody that's interested. Then we're going to talk about the incident and how that's affected Hollywood and the directors involved with this and other actors. And then we're going to review the film because it is a film that needs a good reviewing in its own right. Um, but um, well, did you know, because this is uh, Rod Serling was the sort of the, the creative behind this. Did you know that he's an uh, amateur inventor? Yes, I did. And his hot dog shaped burger didn't catch on. I heard. <laughs> I didn't. I don't get that. I was like, I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot dog length, like, you know, a rectangle, like a, you know, length. And, but it'd be a burger patty. I don't I don't like the one. shape of a hot dog. A hot dog's cool because it's in that shape, but I don't want it in any other shape. It's weird to have a long burger. <clears throat> yeah. Well, let's talk about the brief history of The Twilight Zone. It started, it was the TV show, for anyone that doesn't know, started in 1959. It's a staple of American television. I imagine it fucking was. Do you know what I mean? Some Because some of them still now are really good. Real good storytelling, uh, creepy, scary. Imagine that back in the day, you had nothing on. That would be the thing to watch. It was black and white as well to start yeah, off with. Yeah. Um, and basically, um, the stories were science fiction, fantasy, dystopian, you know, horror, supernatural, black comedy. Do you know what sort of time of day it aired? Would it have been an evening affair? Uh, it would have been evenings, yeah. Okay. It, it would have been shown at evenings. Um, it ran for uh, five seasons from uh, 1959 all the way through to 1964. Did it play on UK TV? 
Um, I'm not sure if the original one did, but then it came back in the 80s for three new seasons, um, which was 85, 86, and then a later one in 88. And that played in the UK, because I do remember that being on the television occasionally. Then they did another series um, in 2002, just one series, um, which ran up until 2003. Then they did Jordan Peele, then got the rights in 2019. And he did two seasons of it as well, 20 episodes in total. Oh, really? Well, they didn't didn't do Brilliant Name? I, okay? I've never seen them. I've never seen them. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd like to sit down one day and work my way through everything because I, I don't know where they play. I've seen the old episode here and there, and they're fantastic. And like you say, especially those old black and white ones, they are a staple. Um, and then obviously we we got um, the movie, which we're going to be discussing in a moment. So Twilight Zone was always a short, a later, a longer episode, and that's where it started to fall down apparently because. It used to run for about half an hour, and there was always a twist at the end or some kind of weird... Half an hour is a nice, sweet, sweet time, yeah. that's for sure. <clears throat> but as it got more popular, they tried to extend it to almost an hour. and Probably they could... because they were putting adverts in. Yeah, they couldn't quite fill the runtime, and, and the stories weren't as good towards the end. So, But yeah, that's what the Twilight Zone is. Everybody knows the music. And it used to open with a guy... I've got a uh, uh, soundtrack... Twilight Zone, uh, the TV show soundtrack of vinyl, and it's great. He used to start off with that chilling um, couple of sentences. You unlock the, this door uh, with a key of your imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, sight, and a dimension of your mind. You move into a land of shadows and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed into the Twilight Zone. I mean, if that doesn't get you goosebumps up, in the 60s when you're watching this and jesus man yeah <clears throat> do you know what i mean that's just just awesome now so yeah we got those four directors so joe dante john landis george miller steven spielberg they all directed a segment each there's an opening and a closing with dan Aykroyd in it you've got a lot of good actors in this which again we'll come to as we work our way through it um however tragedy struck we've alluded to this throughout and I'm sure you guys probably know who are listening but if not we are now going to talk about what happened filming the first segment to the actor vic morrow and two children yeah we're just going to quickly go through it now and then we can just go through the stories of the film rather than have this in, uh, into it because it's not generally uh, a movie we cover uh, has um um three people be beheaded by um a rotary blade or whatever it was from the uh, yeah. helicopter it, it, it's just insane yeah so joe uh john landis we love his work um but he is a bit of a dick because i think slightly reckless reckless that so the, the, the it changed up until this incident directors had ultimate power and that shouldn't be the case because they don't know about safety regulations and firearms and helicopters and stunts and all this other business. But this this is the guy who was fresh off of making American Werewolf in London. He was a hot shit. He did Animal House. Um, and there was, I'm not saying, you know, we always talk about 80s coke, but these sort of things were flying around in the 80s. People's power was going to their head. Hollywood was, you know, hitting a new high. These four directors were coming together. There was probably a lot of hype around this. And he was filming his opening segment. It's, it's of, of, in the early 80s, uh, especially in America, more than England, very rock and roll. Um, I, well, it was around around the world. Like we looked at earlier, like the mid seventies to early eighties of Australia and their stunt people, and just, and just the way it was, it was really like fucking. We don't give a shit. Let's just fucking try. Let's just go for it. Come on, let's just fucking do it. Uh, mentality uh, without thinking of consequences at times. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the story we'll get into when we when we review the film, but um. Essentially, what happened was there were some signs that he was that um, John Landis was getting a bit big for his own boots because apparently, 
in one scene, he insisted on live rounds in machine guns mm. um, in this scene, that, which takes place during the Vietnam War, where these guys, so these, he made all these actors fire their live ammunition from machine guns, not just guns, machine guns, into a load of foliage, a load of bracken, as Gav would say. <clears throat> um, now, firstly, there's some danger there, right? Come on. Well, yeah. M16 assault rifles been fired into foliage just for the sake of cinema. Yeah, it's not needed. You don't need that. No, it, it, it is. It's one of these things, like uh, uh, especially as a director and the pressure that goes on, and and um, that sort of thing where like it's time sensitive. We've got to go. We've got to go. We've got to go. We've got to keep it cheap as we can. We've got to do it as quick as we can. <laughs> And <clears throat> that whole pressure thing and making decisions, but yeah, it's just a catalyst. Everything like the whole production thing here, like apparently John Landis was to say to people, "Look, just tell the fire chief who is also like the uh, uh, the the person that looks after the children's welfare, um, look, just hide the ki- hide the kids when he's around. Don't yep. let him know because <clears throat> they were being paid as supposedly also under the table, cash in hand to the parents. The parents were told they were said, "Is it a dangerous stunt?" They were told, "No." Vic Morrow's about to do the stunt, and he's like, uh, "I'm crazy for doing this. Uh, I, uh, this is just absolutely insane." Like what he had to do, he'd already had a premonition years ago that he was going to die in a helicopter accident. Yeah, which is weird. Uh, John Landis was just like, "Fucking, let's just fucking go for it. Come on." Um, uh, someone said. To so, God, that was just crazy what happened. John Anders said, You haven't seen nothing yet. Yep. There's so much going on, and uh, you, you can just tell from the pressure. Like, we, we had the smallest amount of pressure in Star Wars uh, when we did the Sanctuary Moon, YouTube, check it out now. Um, uh, that night show, nice because everyone was getting very cold to the point where it was like, I don't want someone to get hyperthermia or some shit lying on the floor. Um, uh, so we had to keep going and that wasn't even that bad no one was going to actually die this is that is what they're doing is like 300 times that and that itself is a tiring and a bit like <coughs> fucking hell but can you imagine that sort of scene but if they're doing it with like not correctly because the kids weren't supposed to be there it's night shoots the kids aren't supposed to do that they're young kids they should be three o'clock four o'clock that's them done Yeah, so to paint the picture, this was all part of a deleted scene from the opening segment where um, Vic Morrow's character saves some children, um, some Vietnamese children. Um, It's all part of his character's redemption because he's a terrible bigot and racist. Um, And again, we'll cover this properly when we do the story. Um, So this scene involved him saving a Vietnamese boy and girl in a river from um, enemy fire from a helicopter. So... Yeah, they did. They did a couple of tests. They made some explosions. Mike Gabs just said, he said, if you think that was big, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, he basically paid these children under the table or paid their parents under the table so that they didn't have to, so that they could work. He said, this is only going to work if we shoot it at midnight or one in the morning. So he had these children up really late. Um, and um, they were really obviously close to explosives, a helicopter. Vic Morrow was a very well-established actor, um, and the helicopter pilot kept saying, "Like, I just, I don't have a good feeling about this. I, I sort of these explosions sort of rock the helicopter a bit too much for me." Obviously, the director's like, "No, I don't care. I'm the director. Keep going. Keep. We're going to do it again." Well, sadly. One of the explosions, one the, the last time, as <laughs> it was the last time, the explosions um, were so real that they did rock the helicopter as Vic Morrow picked up one of the children under each arm and it tipped over and landed rotors first on the three of them. Um, now, the first people to run over were john landis and his assistant and a couple of other people then started coming over because obviously this this looked like people could potentially be hurt apparently vic morrow's headless torso bobbed out of the water now we should again issue that trigger warning for some of the things i'm about to describe um 
and they just shoved it aside thinking it was a prop that had fallen out of the helicopter they then saw his head oh separated God. from it and realized okay something's gone wrong then they found sadly one of the children had been beheaded by the the helicopter the other child actually wasn't beheaded they were crushed and killed by the helicopter so for the sake of a shot he's killed a man and two children two children that weren't even um insured they were being paid illegally under the table they were working out of the hours children are only allowed to work until something like 6 p.m in hollywood and this was midnight what maybe later um and these two children were, were were so so young. I believe they were nine and, and ten or something. Um, it, then, because of that, Spielberg didn't ever want to didn't want to be associated with this. But he'd already filmed a lot of his segment, um, uh, and, he, I, he, and his association to John Landis completely went. Yeah, and actually, a lot of people in Hollywood cut ties with him. Yeah, and then his behaviour afterwards was insane, Gav, wasn't it? You know, he went He went to the children's funeral and gave a eulogy at Vic Morrow's funeral and... Said about film will last forever. And yeah. All stuff, but basically saying, like, you know, because obviously Vic's on the film. I, I personally was... Uh, I'm kind of disgusted that the episode was, was ever even released. And I know why, but because <laughs> they've all put all the money into it, so we've got to do it, and it'd be the studio saying that and looking at their bank balances. But I think the episode should have just been... It should have just been the three episodes, or, or the three episodes were put out as TV, like a TV movie special or something like that. I, see, I guess it's deemed a massive thing at the time because of who is involved on a cinematic scale rather than a television scale. But... It just uh, the episode shouldn't have gone out. It's just disgusting. Landis spent the next five years in and out of court um, because him and four of the crew members were standing trial for involuntary manslaughter. They were ultimately acquitted, um, but like I say, he has lost a lot of respect from a lot of people. I am someone that can separate the art from the artist. I love some of John Landis's movies, a lot of them, um, but yeah. his behaviour was crazy around this. You know, Eddie Murphy famously worked with him in Beverly Hills Cop, but um, said, "There's in the future, there's more." Ch-. He actually said, "There's more chance of Vic Morrow working with John Landis again than me," which is a he very did nasty the joke. Beverly Hills Cop Cop Four, though. At uh, three, 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 yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's. Uh, it's crazy. <clears throat> it's a tragedy. Mm. But <clears throat> the silver lining, the, the thing that came out of this, similar to some of the other things we discussed in World of the Strangers, they, they've they scrutinised and changed the laws so much now so that particularly children are protected, but also <laughs> actors, stunt performers. Well, you'd like to think people have got some fucking common sense and they're not just thinking out their fucking arse, not thinking, it's for the picture, darling. But also, you know... Um, I love Spielberg. He's my favourite director of all time. But there were times on the set of Jules that he pushed the levels of health and safety because back then directors were this all-powerful thing. Hollywood films were making so much money that they were allowed to just play in their playground and go crazy. Um, And it's probably happened on thousands of other films, if not at least hundreds. But... This is one of the most tragic ones. I've seen the footage, Gav. I know you have as well. I wouldn't recommend it. You don't really see any bodies or anything properly, but you do see the helicopter land on what you know is a real man and two real children. Um, They could have just had dummies under their arms, which he apparently asked for, because Vic Morrow said, yeah, I'm getting tired of picking these kids up. You know, I can barely pick up my two-and-a-half-year-olds, but picking up a nine- and a ten-year-old and running through water with them Mm. With a helicopter over your head and explosions going off, you're not a stunt man. And, and it's going to look like a shit performance. If you have lead actors just go, oh, oh, trying to get through water, it's going to look rubbish. So you wanted dummies, but they said no. It's just it's just so fucking ridiculous as well. Because it'd be like, yeah, just have dummies. It'd be quicker. We get the job done easier. Don't worry about it. Fucking, it's just fucking. Oh, sometimes movie sets are just ridiculous. 
Yeah. Too much <clears> money for in a sense most of the time. But, but obviously not here really because I've always why did <coughs> why did he do this? Was it because he could speed through the production and get it done quicker, or why didn't he go through the right channels? Surely they could have had children there, but. I bet it would have cost a shit ton more to go through the right channels of having children there at that night doing a stunt like that, and the insurance would have been fucking crazy, I bet. I think and ultimately, that's probably why they cut it. So it's probably just trying to get away from paying so much. Ultimately, I don't even think it was saving money. I think it was because I can. It was, I'm a, I've got the power, and I'm going to do it. And he's getting a kick out of, yeah. you know... Because he could have filmed that in a studio, he could have filmed that in the day, they could have shot day for night, they could have done a, a bunch of things. They could have. John, John Landis is a very big personality, he's that sort of yeah. person, walks in a room, oh, I'm, no, it's me, I'm John Landis. You imagine the same sort of thing, not comparing him to Harvey Weinstein, but imagine the same sort of thing if Raymond <clears> Weinstein <throat> walked into a room, or, or Johnny Depp or something like that, he, you know... Um, yeah. John Landis does have that because of all the people he's worked with and the stuff that he's done. And he continues to work to this day. He um, does. Um, in fact, in fact, one of his films he, he produced was called To Kill a Child, randomly. Um, bit odd. Um, but then but he got look, like, like his, his son is not much better. Yeah, he's, he's so been... He's done some not very nice, pleasant things, apparently. Yeah, he's not exactly in the Me Too camp of being liked, is he? So... <clears throat> well, that is the dark side of this movie, but there are. It is a fun film at times. It's hard to watch the first segment. We are going to talk about it. Um, well, it, the trouble is because of this, John um, uh, Spielberg was just like fuck that and didn't want to do any post whatsoever. Yeah, well, it, <coughs> so because just, of that, just cut out Spiel of it and just left left people just to finish the film. He's like, yeah, whatever. So you you're kind of starting to get like the second story. It's a bit like it's all right, and that's it. Spielberg's, but it it has a touch, but it's just not there. It's not Spielberg's finished. story is the weakest yeah. in this. Um, that might be also which is short. crazy because that, that might be also short form though. Some people can't do short form like Ty West. Not very good at short form. But then we've also got Joe Dante directing one of my favourite segments towards the end. Um, everybody knows Joe Dante. Love his work, and crazy that George Miller, Mad Mr. Mad Max, who's got another Mad Max movie coming out soon, Furiosa, um, which the trailer looks amazing. Um, <clears throat> uh, he directed the final segment, so yeah, I'm actually wrong. Uh, it was George Miller who uh, uh, just dropped everything in post because he was so disgusted by the what happened, and he, apparently, he, he got out of it. Apparently Spielberg was on set the day that they fired live ammunition and he ran away. He said, I don't want to be involved with this. And he ran off. He had the power to, to say, say something or do something. So I don't think it's just, obviously Landis is the, the main villain. It here. seems to be too many cooks. Yep. Too, too much going on. And this is what happens with, multiple directors on a film especially it sounds good on paper let's get all these guys together these days that might be all right with all the health and safety checks and everything but back then a bit crazy really a bit crazy it wasn't like they were making a low budget sort of creep show type movie this was pretty big budget so, sometimes <clears throat> making films and that i know how sometimes it's like i said like the cameraman being so ob so like focus is so in there that the rest of the world doesn't exist at that moment well the amount of times that one of us saved ben on the set of sanctuary moon who was about to trip over something or fall backwards a couple of nasty you know tree stumps and stuff yeah, you're just absorbed yeah he was I, in the I, I, I totally understand it but sometimes though health and safety it just has to prevail and just like go look this is not come on somebody where are we not looking at this picture everybody you know ben was freaked out when say century moon when i you remember the wooden trap spike traps he was yeah, freaked yeah. out and izzy wasn't even anywhere <clears throat> near them and he was so freaked out that i know he kept telling everybody to be careful don't go near the spikes yeah that i made yeah, yeah. But, but look that that's the dark side of twilight zone um, we talked about the directors and it's got a really stacked cast as well um, it's obviously got a wrap around so it's got your opening not and your rapper. end it's not got a wrap Rakim's not it in this it wouldn't have surprised you if Dan Aykroyd rapped on it though 
I would have loved it. He would have done the old dragnet. (laughs) We can read each other's minds, can't we? Um, All right, well, let's do this. Let's get into it, Gav. Twilight Zone, the movie. (laughs) You start off. now in Twilight Zone. I should probably mention, similar to your American Werewolf in London story, I couldn't get past this scene. I had to do this scene, this film in bits when I was a kid because... As soon as it got to the, you want to see something scary, that face. I couldn't remember it. Turned it off. Watching couldn't, this again. I said to my dad, I don't want to see this anymore. I've actually it's got this scared. on videotape. Um, I couldn't remember that. Um, I could only remember the uh, Adam Green and Joe Lynch did uh, the Road to Fright Fest, which you could probably find on YouTube, I guess. And they actually copied this. And it yeah. was pretty funny, actually. There's that. Um, and then I, I managed to get... F- after a couple of times, I got through that. And I was very young. I was probably 10 or something. It was on television and my parents let me stay up late or something, school holidays. And then eventually I got to the segment, the Joe Dante segment. I couldn't get through that. Um, so I managed to make it quite a way through the film. It wasn't until I was much older that I managed to sit through the entire thing. And now I'm like, it's, I really enjoy it. I think it's great. And then obviously when the internet came out in YouTube and IMDb, I then found out all the backstory on this film, which now made me think of it in a different way. Yeah. But yeah, it took me a long time to get through this film as a young boy into a teenager because of certain scenes. So this, it definitely got under my skin a bit, but we'll come to these segments as we talk about them. So yeah, we start off on the highway at night. Beautiful song playing. CCR, come on. It's a midnight special. Shine a light on me. We've got um, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks is driving along. And uh, they're singing along to this song. They're enjoying it. And I think, if I'm right, Dan Aykroyd has been picked up like a hitchhiker. Because they don't seem to know each other that well. And um, they're singing and then suddenly the tape chews up. This is something that you youngsters might not be aware of, Gav, is a, a tapes getting chewed up. Yeah, that's a fucker. Used to, used to be so annoying when that happened. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so they turn off the music and they start talking about things and telling jokes. And then Dan Ackroyd says, hey, you want to see something really scary? Oh, actually, first of all, Albert Brooks says, do you want to see something scary? And he turns off the lights as he's driving. Who, direct, who directed this segment? I don't know who directed the opening segments, actually. Okay. I should probably see if I can find out if you know. Uh, I can look, I can look. Yeah, uh, so he's driving along. I had someone do this to me once. My friend Dawn did this to me once. She turned off all the lights on her car while she was driving me along. Uh, John Landers. Ah, okay. Interesting. Um, Yeah, it feels a bit lame to see, I suppose. So Dan Aykroyd's freaking out. He's like, turn the lights on. We might hit something. We might go into a tree. We might go off the road. So he's like, all right, right, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Then they start playing a game of, like, guess this tune from this TV show. And it's all quite jovial until he says, hey, Dan Aykroyd says, do you you want to see something really scary? And his buddy's like, yeah, okay. He's like, scare me. Go on, scare me. And he's like, all right, you need to pull over. What? Just show me. No, 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 I can't. Pull over, pull over. I need to really show you this. And he says, go on then. What are you going to do? And he says, wait there. And he sort of turns away from him for a bit. And Albert Brooks is like, well, what's that? What are you doing? And when he turns around, he's got this weird sort of zombie witch face, hasn't he? Yeah. And he just strangles him to death. But as a kid, that I did not expect that to happen. And I was instantly like running out of the room. Didn't want to see any more of this film. <laughs> that yeah. was the first five minutes. I was like, I'm done. I can't, I can't see any more. It's, it's definitely a good opening if you're a kid, for sure. Fuck you know, I couldn't handle it. I was out of there. I had a friend that did that to me once. Um, I think I've said about it before, but he pulled over and said, uh, and I said, well, if you pulled over and it's literally middle of nowhere like this. He said, oh, I'm going to kill you. What? And it just went on for ages. Him just sitting there going, no, I'm, I'm pulled over because I'm going to kill you. And it really, like that, the whole time, really deadpan. It was a bit weird. The funny thing about this scene, and this is a shout out to our buddy RJ McCready. He always gets a mention from him in some way. Um, they parodied this in a, in a TV show called Highway to Heaven, which I'm sure you remember, Gav. Um, the about name. Michael Landis is an angel that oh, sent... Oh, yes. 
sent to Earth, and he's got a buddy called Marcus, a human, who what? has to help him on his missions every week. What was his missions? I can't remember. He, he just had to help people. It's a bit like Quantum Leap, but he was an angel, and he'd move from town to town. Or like the Incredible Hulk, he'd move from town to town, like, helping like people out. But because he was an angel, he had like certain powers every week. I love the fact that all the TV shows in the eighties was about someone just going from town to town helping yep. people. Knight Rider, Street Hawk, every they all time. just everyone was just wandering around. Helping Even just people. Jessica Fletcher, she was they, always. I wonder if they crossed across the streams. Yeah, Jessica Fletcher, she's gone on holiday. Someone's died. She needs to investigate you, it. The apparent, I think, apparently, there's a Knight Rider uh, uh, murder she wrote uh, combo episode. No, no, it's. I told you this. It's Magnum. Magnum Humbug. meets Jessica Fletcher. Man, that's going to be my Christmas day. You You've got to watch I've it. I've still it's not so seen it. I can't believe it. I haven't seen the it The funniest bit about it is he, Tom Selleck, being the hunk that he is, he's getting out of the shower in his hotel room and he's only got a towel on. Imagine if those two got it on. And Jessica Fletcher comes in and she's like, oh my word, I'm so sorry. I thought this was my hotel room. They've given me the key. And he's like, uh, no. I." And then he says, I'm Thomas Magnum. And she's like, oh, Jessica Fletcher, nice to meet you. And they have a little chat and then they sort of help each other on this case. I can't wait to watch it. It's so good. It's so good. I, I might wait for my birthday. But anyway, the reason I'm going talking about this is because there's one scene... I think it was a Halloween episode where Marcus and um, Michael Landis are driving along and he says to Marcus, so the angel says, hey, do you want to see something really scary? And Marcus says, yeah, go on then. So he says, pull over. He does the whole thing. And when he turns around, he's got Marcus's face and he's scared him with his own face. But I remember watching that thinking, oh, they've parodied that film that I don't like. Oh. So even, I wasn't even safe watching Highway to Heaven. Oh, God. But the reason I say that is because me and, me and RJ were chatting about that recently, and it's, it's good. It was on Netflix, and they took it all away from me before I could even get started on it. Oh, shit, I didn't even realise. Damn it. Anyway, so there we go. So our first segment is called Time Out. Oh, yeah. there's, no, there's, there's no cat in this one to tie it all together um but yeah we cut to our first segment called time out and we do get a voiceover for each one and this voiceover is telling us about bill connor who's played by vic morrow and again i feel like this episode out of respect should have just been cut i mean it, it's also got some terribly racist language in it hasn't it yeah it does go there it, well, um, well it, it's because they're trying to uh, put across how bad he is as a character. Yeah, so Vic Morrow enters this bar um, and he meets his friends and they're all having drinks. And well, he's really... from The Thing. Yeah, the guy from The Thing with the jumper. And then is the other mates, the fucking dude who keeps getting it all wrong in Black Christmas. <laughs> Felicio! F-E-L-A... He got it wrong again, Nash! John Saxon. Hey, Chief! What's Felicio? Then the guy just laughing the whole time. <laughs> There's a detective in the background. Man, I can't wait. To... I've got my Blu ray copy. I can't wait. Always watch that every year. Can't Always wait. watch that. Can't so wait. good. Um, so, yeah, Bill, Bill Vic Morrow didn't get promoted in his new job. So, he and his buddies are having some drinks, drying their sorrows. He starts saying it was some Jewish bastard that got it. So you're thinking, oh, okay. Not not a nice thing to sort of say, but oh well. And then a waitress comes over, quite a pretty young waitress, and he says, hey, maybe you can cheer me up. And he sort of slaps her on the butt. Yes, it's not very good behaviour. And then he, then he starts saying some really anti-Semitic words, which I won't say, about his Jewish colleagues. He then starts dropping the N-word in there. Saying the, all, the, the, the group of uh, uh, African Americans next door don't. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's three black happy. guys having a quiet drink next to him, and Go, they're like, "Can you keep your own views to yourself, please?" They're, they're, they're quite calm about it they initially, are, aren't they? they? Are. Um, but the whole bar starts noticing because he starts ranting and using all these slurs, basically saying that all the Jewish and black people get promoted above him. I'm an American. He keeps saying, I'm a white American. I should be, you know, and he's really entitled. Um, he said, I fought in Korea. And then he starts using words about Koreans as well. And you're like, man, this guy is a piece of shit. Uh, he says, I'm better than any N word, G word or J word because I'm an American. Um, the, the black guys sort of lean over and they say, Hey buddy, you know, 
could you, uh, we're just trying to enjoy a quiet drink here. We don't want any trouble, but basically what they say to him is, if you carry on saying that, we're going to fuck you up. <laughs> but he doesn't listen to them. He storms out screaming, I'm an American. And uh, he leaves he, the bar. When he uh, leaves the uh, uh, public house, he discovers he is in 19, what is it, uh, 41, what is he? Yeah, he's in Nazi-occupied France. But, but just before that, I do love how calm the black guys are, because when he storms out, they go over to... Well, no, they sort of call over to his buddies, and they go, we're really sorry about your buddy, as in, we're really sorry you're friends with that piece of shit. They're just so calm about it. It's like, wow, these guys are the most chilled. <laughs> yeah. But yes, he somehow is well, being transported. Well, you've got to imagine that that was... Uh, probably what they heard daily basis continuously i know it's shit isn't it that's why it, they were just like yeah it's just this dude there's no point having a five having a nice drink you know but yes big morrow is now in nazi occupied france during the war yeah how has this happened he is confused he doesn't understand some nazis pull up in their jeep and thinking, basically asking for his papers. But he's just like, he must be like, where's the fancy dress party? I'd say, <laughs> I'm really confused. Did they drop acid in my drink? He says to them, I'm an American, don't you know? And they start looking at his papers. They start questioning him. Um, he, he doesn't understand them because he doesn't speak German. So they take his wallet and they're querying his clothes because obviously he's wearing, to them, futuristic clothing as well. And he realises... No matter how crazy this seems, this is real because they've got guns. Um, so he fights them off and he runs off, but they shoot at him and they shoot him in the arm. And so that's when he realizes, oh, this is, He's this like, is obviously Fuck. real. Yeah. They call for reinforcements. You know, they're on the hunt now for this, this what they think is a Jew who's running around. So they, uh, he's hiding a bit while they start searching for him. More and more Nazis arrive when they blow their little Nazi whistle. <laughs> That calls the Nazis if you do that. <laughs> Is that oh, a Nazi just, whistle? Don't do it too much because they'll. You don't want them coming. Okay. Uh, do you think they're the mo- they're probably one of the most hated people ever, aren't they, Nazis? They're just this absolute scum. Uh, well, um, they only would are because so much media attention, the photographs and evidence of it um, on such a grand scale. There was obviously previously <clears throat> in the history other tyrannical ty- tyrants. <laughs> ty- tyrannical tyrant. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, but uh, because of media not being there to uh, absorb and take in and uh, 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 let everybody see it, we, you know. And Nazis is a very uh, easy and quite a, not, I'm not going to say a cool word, because that's obviously not what I want to say about the word Nazi at all. But it's a Nazi, it's very quick, easy, it's something you can, do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah it's just prevalent still to uh, uh, like our parents or our grandparents or whatever, you know, still in culture. So, yes. Well, there are other groups, you're right. We are going to meet some of them in a minute. Some hooded gentlemen mm. with white with white hoods. We'll meet them in a minute. But yeah, he, so he's shot, he runs, he hides. Uh, he enters what he thinks is an abandoned building and he comes across a German family who instantly dob him in. They instantly call to the Nazis, there's, a, there's someone up here because they, you know, they don't want any trouble and they know that if they if they tell the Nazis... If they don't, they'll probably get accused of hiding him, so they have to tell them. So she shouts out the window. Um, he manages to climb out onto a, another ledge. Uh, he climbs it on the ledge. He's shot at, and the Nazis are playing, um, basically, who can shoot as close to him as possible while he's hanging onto this ledge of a building. Uh, he manages. He falls... And as he falls, he lands and wakes up in 1950s Alabama. Oh, boy. With the Ku Klux Klan surrounding him. Immediately calling him an N-word. Uh, yeah, uh, so we find out that he is actually now a uh, a black person, but like we see him still as a white person on screen, but like his reflection would show him as a black person. So this is like an episode of Quantum Neat gone terribly yeah, wrong. Absolutely, that's the best uh, explanation, yeah. 
Um, they immediately call him the Emperor. They tie him to a state. Did that never happen to him? I'm oh sure yeah, it must have done. There was there was an episode like women, where, like a black woman, even. Like there was an sorts. episode. Uh, well, uh, it's my favourite TV show of all time, as I've said before. But there was one episode. It, it in was the a very good season. innocent show, wasn't it? There was one episode in the first season where he, because obviously when he leaps, he doesn't quite know who he is till he can look in a mirror. So he's in. He, he turns into whoever he is, and he walks into this cafe. And he figures it's probably around about the 50s here. He sits down at the cafe, at the, the bar, and he says, oh, can I get a coffee, please? And everybody's looking at him disgustedly. And then he hears all the southern accents, and he looks up in the mirror, and he realizes he's a, he's a black guy. And he just walked into a diner, a white diner, and ordered a coffee. And that's when it says, to be continued, and you see him tweet. I haven't seen it. I used to enjoy it, but I haven't seen it probably for like 30 years, to be honest with you. What, is it an action sh- what, what What was the thing that kept you going? I know you had Ziggy, wasn't it, on the old uh, little thing. But was it like an action pack thing? What was it? Or more yeah, just yeah, drama? Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was everything. Because Scott Bakula, who played who played I need um, to watch Sam Beckett, yeah. he basically he was an incredible actor. He, he can do martial arts, sing, dance. He's an all-round kind of actor really um so every episode he got to play a a disabled person a black person a woman Uh, there was one episode where he was leapt into the body of a chimp um loads of different things and he got to play all these different scenarios and he obviously had to fix that person's life yeah it was like an aspect of the life where he intervenes so good you have to watch it again you're right it is innocent um but it's so moving at times as well there's vietnam episodes it's like because he can only leap into his own time uh life lifetime so from when he was born which is like 52 or something to the current date which is set in the future which was probably like the year 1999 when it came out but yeah so he's leaping in this like specific time period and he keeps bumping going into all these different things it's it's great honestly it would have been good if it had been christopher walken that would have been nuts Oh my God! <laughs> I've let into a woman's body. <laughs> body. Everybody, when when he's talking, they'll all be like, "Why is he talking about that?" Why is there a gap? Is this guy between every word? Wow! <laughs> they would be, wouldn't they? It would be funny. Anyway, well, there we go. Anyway, so they tie him to st- <laughs> cut him back to the KKK. They tie him to a stake and they start chanting, "Hang him, hang him!" He starts saying, "I'm a white man. What are you doing?" So obviously, <laughs> at this point, as an audience member, you've realised this is a lesson in uh, uh, being not being a, a racist. Yeah, basically a bigot. I I don't say it often, Gav, but I would say this is a lesson in don't be a cunt. Yep, cunt lessons. Um, <laughs> Stunning cunts. No, cunning stunts. I said it the wrong way around. I didn't even mean to do that. Anyway, he there's a fire, obviously kicks off, and he manages to escape. Stunning um, cunts. I know. Uh, he manages to escape, and they set the dogs after him. So he jumps into That's a lake. That's a coffee table book, isn't it? Carry on. Cunning, cunning stunts. When he, he jumps into a lake to escape these KKK guys, and when he pops up at the other end of the water, he is suddenly in Vietnam. Yeah. Join the war. What yeah. is going on? Yeah. So he sneaks through the jungle. He sees a snake. Um, he sees some Vietnamese, Vietnamese soldiers with guns nearby. He hears some rock music playing, and he thinks, Ah, oh, USA are Speak here. Jimi Hendrix. USA! USA! He thinks, great, they're here. But 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 no, they're not happy. But they not see happy. him. They see him as a Vietnamese soldier, don't they? Yeah, and just before this, they've just been shooting like everything in a 360 radius, well, like a 270 radius, just firing everything with the live ammo, which John Anders wanted. Make sure the plants get real bullets in them. Why? Because I'm John Landis. Make sure. Because the audience at home are watching it are not going to see it, so don't worry about it. But, John, there's no such thing as real werewolves. I want a real werewolf on this film set. <laughs> I want would, it. That would be an amazing behind-the-scenes fake <laughs> mockumentary movie. Where the director's just... Get set, me a I werewolf. want a real werewolf. And if I'd be like, I found one. We've got one. What? A real werewolf? Now I've gone off that picture now. I've done... I'm doing something else now. Zombies. 
Give me get, a zombie. Get me Dick Miller. I need Dick Miller. Um, so they shoot at him, thinking he's a Vietnamese soldier. Uh, they throw a grenade at him, and this launches him out of the water back into Nazi-occupied France. He is never going to be racist again. He is fucked. He gets shot in the leg this time, and he's, he's realised now what's going on. He's been a black guy in Alabama. He's been a Vietnamese person during the war. He's been a, a, a Jewish person during you know the Nazis' um, reign of terror. And he's back there now. And the last shot of him now is they put a Star of David on him which is what they used to do to the Jews before they chuck them on the trains. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure, and I do apologise if if just dropping the word Jew is not correct, because I know in, there was an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where they say about dropping a hard Jew, you're apparently supposed to, the hard J, you're supposed to say Jewish, not a Jew. So I do apologise, I've said that a couple of times. But that's what they used to do to the Jewish prisoners of war. They would put the Star of David on their chest, then load them onto the freight train to send them off to the concentration camps. And he's on this train full of Jewish prisoners. And he looks through the slats of the train as it's pulling away. And he sees the bar that he's come out of. And he thinks, there's my buddies. And they've come out going, Bill? There's Nash getting it all wrong. Bill! Fellatio. <laughs> He's just shouting, Fellatio! <laughs> Do they even know where Fellatio Street is? And he is taken off, as we assume, to a concentration camp to meet his fate, whatever that may be. Now, obviously, the, there was a deleted scene, which probably wouldn't have added much to the story of him saving two children in the jungle, it would have maybe... It, well, it, it, it shows him redeeming, like, the fact that he's not being so racist going to save these children. But yeah. it, it definitely doesn't make me go, if that was in the story, man, that story is well worth um, people dying. All it would have done was added, like, a Nothing. pretty cool a pretty cool looking helicopter stunt with explosions, yeah. but yeah. for what it's worth, man, it wasn't worth what happened. No, not at all. <clears throat> and that's the end of segment one, directed by John Landis, you naughty man who should have followed the rules a little bit more, you silly boy. Then we move on to the weakest segment, in my opinion, the second segment, which is, I never thought I'd say that from Spielberg, he's my favourite, but it's not that great. It feels like, um, uh, what's that movie with Steve Guttenberg? Cocoon, you know where the old people turn young it's a bit like that kind of thing it's very spielberg i suppose it's all very light and airy fairy and harmless yeah but i'm not really going to say much about this one I, I i do think because of what happened probably did affect stuff apparently spielberg did try to like get it cancelled i don't know if it is like the whole production but i presume at that point so far gone so much money spent that they're just going to go no but surely if you've got insurance oh no because of what happened I wonder how they got out of it it must have settled out of court you know um, no. but but I I imagine uh, and Spielberg couldn't get it shut down so the studios kept it going so I imagine that he probably went and did bare minimal uh, for contractual reasons or like you know he can't fuck around with that studio because he Works for that studio, you know. It was it Universal, by any chance? Um, I'm not sure. <coughs> Excuse oh, me. I'm not sure actually. Um, the studio for this one. I'll look it up. <clears throat> but yeah, this is definitely the weakest one. Essentially, guys, what happens in this one is there's a Sunnyvale retirement home full of OAPs, as we call them in the UK, old age pensioners, people who don't have anybody, so they get put in a an old person's home. And Scatman Crothers. Um, from The Shining, uh, who also voiced Hong Kong Fui. He is some kind of like supernatural old person. Uh, very quickly, sorry. It was Warner Brothers and Amblin Entertainment, but uncredited. Uh, yes, of course. So that he... means he took his name off for his company. So. Yeah, no surprise. So Scatman Crothers essentially grants all the old people for one night the chance to turn back to themselves at their prime which was like they're all like 10 11 12 13 so they all go outside at night and they all turn back into these younger versions of themselves they enjoy it they enjoy it they enjoy it he gives them a choice of 
you can either stay like this or I can change you back. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you'll be old again. And they all sort of say, but if I stay like this, I have to go through puberty again. I have to lose my parents again. I have to. And they realize that although they've all really been longing to have their youth back, they've actually lived a full life. They've gained lots of life experiences, some of which they don't really want to go through again. Um, apart from one guy who didn't believe them, didn't go out, never became old. But he now he's the one that learns the biggest lesson because he learns to cherish his life and not regret that he's old it's not great it's it's it doesn't feel like it belongs in this which essentially is mainly horror well one thing is spielberg who wrote this not sure who wrote this segment so this is kick the can okay let me uh but um it feels like spielberg definitely but it's been done better by Ron Howard, who directed Cocoon, where the aliens um, give the the old people the you know they don't make them kids, but they give them youth and strength and health, and it, that's a much better film. And people might slate that film, but I really like Cocoon. Anything with Steve Guttenberg in it. Well, I, I just feel like also like Spielberg wasn't at a time old. I, I don't know. He doesn't. Of course, he knows how to tell a story <clears> and get across emotion of different generations. But I don't know if he's the right. Maybe that's not the wrong <clears> way of looking at it. I don't know what the problem is with it because it, maybe it's a short film and like he can't get across that that emotional pull that he gets from us with like the operatic music we have going on not operatic you know, orchestral music we have going on and the way he pulls us over long periods of time to get really like love et or or whatever and go along with the journey it's a real story it's a real like adventure you come out of it go oh amazing feeling good i i think short form isn't spielberg's forte I agree. I agree. And it does look Spielberg. It's shot with a very sort of loving, yeah. Yeah. you know, all for, you know, it's all very, I don't know how you describe that look, Gav, where it looks like the camera's a little blurry. Do you know what I mean? It's got that kind of lovely, hazy. Uh, Vaseline on the old uh, Yeah, Vaseline on the on lens. The old lens. I love a bit of Vaseline on my lens. But yeah, and at the end, Scatman Crothers, skip it about, boo, 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 hey, Danny, you gotta use the shining. The, um, <laughs> it's that was Christopher more... Walken scatting. And it sounded more like um, Bill Cosby, actually. Oh, yeah. Imagine him turning up in the shining. Any skip film, it about, boo, any, boo, any boo, film boo, is going to be a horror film of Bill Cosby. I was about to say Bing Cosby. Not Bing. Bing and Bill. I'm dreaming of a wife. I DJed a... Uh, uh, back up a two boop. I DJed Thursday night, and for the first hour and 10 minutes, hour and 15 minutes, I played Christmas music. And I was just like, I played that one now. At one point, I yawned and I looked down because I was like on the stage, and someone in the crowd looked down and looked up, and I could hear him go, He yawned <laughs> to his wife. I said, like, Oh, fucking hell. I was like, Look away when you yawn, Gav, because I was just fucking bored. Did you play there. Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You? Uh, no, I don't think I did, actually. I oh, fucking hell. I, I, I played traditionally old stuff. I was playing... Because it's for people just mingling for the first bit before I got, I got them dancing. Fair enough, fair enough. Yes. Um, okay, so um, that's Spielberg's segment, really. Um, so, yeah, Scatman Crothers, he moves on to another retirement home, and he's clearly going to weave his magic again. And that's that one, so... Sorry, Speely, but uh, we're not going to discuss your segment too much. We're going to move now on to the Joe Dante segment. Dick Miller. Which, which is called It's a Good Life. I love this segment. This is the one that, another one that terrified me when I was a, as a kid. This is very Twilight Zone, very out there. I never liked this one as a kid. It's the one that I only, this is the one, and obviously the aeroplane one, but this one mainly, probably because of the, of the cartoonishness of it, because Joe Dante, um, it's the only one that I really can remember, but I didn't like it, because I think it creeped me out, I think you're right, it didn't feel correct. The girl with the mouth really creeped me out. The the boy, the, the, the corridors, the house, stuck in the house. The power that the boy's got over them. Is I, he it was God? Just, I don't know. It's just. It's not, like he's God or the it devil. Wasn't nice. No, no, and it, <laughs> but that's why I like this. And also, you're right. Let's talk about the cartoonish elements. Um, yeah. I feel like Joe Dante after this 
I know he did Gremlins 2 and and a few other bits with cartoony stuff with him. In fact, I think he directed the Looney Tunes movie with, um, what's his name, Brendan Fraser. Um, so he would have, you can tell he was influenced by those uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. Maybe didn't come quite out so much in Gremlins, although parts of it maybe were. But um, yeah, this has got Joe Dante written all over it, really. Zany, spooky, dark stuff that gets under your skin but also takes place in a family setting yeah um yeah so this is a good one let's talk about this one then so we start off with helen our teacher very very sexy always had a crush on her oh uh i'll I'll, I'll have to find a picture okay helen helen the teacher Uh, okay She's driving along and she pulls into a, um, like a cafe sort of bar where you can buy, I don't know, anything really, diner. And who's working behind the bar? Dick Miller. You're right. Dick Miller. We need Dick Miller. We all need a bit of Dick Miller in our lives. We all need a bit of Dick. And at Christmas, we all need a bit of Dick Mass. Christmas Dick Mass. I'm actually going to get on with some Dick Mass um, soon, <laughs> so I'm going to watch a bit of Saint again. I like Saint. Yeah. It's a good one. Uh, so Dick Miller gives her directions. She's on her way somewhere, and she sees a boy called Anthony, who's playing a video game in the bar. And every time he loses a level on the game, the TV sort of acts up a bit, and the guys in the bar are sort of getting angry. And then they realise it might be the kid that's doing it, and uh, the channels keep changing. So eventually, one of the guys who's getting grumpy, she's okay. I don't really. Okay. I Look, don't have your childhood crush. Own. Your childhood boner. Well, it's manhood now. Your child boner. Oh, no, that sounds wrong. Man. Christ. We're going to get censored here. Um, anyway, this kid eventually, because he's annoying these guys so much because the TV keeps changing channels, one of them pushes him a bit and he runs off. The girl, the woman, Helen, the teacher, confronts these men and sort of says, That was a child. What do you think you're doing? Um, so anyway she leaves she says nice town she gets back in her car with the directions to wherever she's headed and as she starts pulling out she runs her car into the bike with a boy on it as she's pulling out yep hello um and she offers him a ride home to apologize he's not hurt but she offers him a a ride home to apologize now knowing what we know you could probably say that he orchestrated this whole thing because he wanted a new play thing. But either way, we don't know that yet. So they're driving along, and they're driving quite far out of town. And she says, oh, gosh, you live very far away, Anthony, don't you? And he says to her, hey, you know, it's my birthday today. And they pull up on this huge house in the middle of nowhere. He says, why don't you come on in? And she thinks, well, to be fair, A, it's your birthday. B, I ran you over on your birthday. So I should probably come in for a little bit and be nice to you. And they walk inside the house. And this is just... You're right. It all feels so wrong, doesn't it? And weird. And It's well, like... It's yeah. like a nightmare in here. It's just... <clears throat> it's not right. It is very much almost like your omen. So we've got his sister, played by Bart Simpson. Nancy Cartwright. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. And she sat watching TV with their uncle... Um, they're watching cartoons on TV, and that's all they seem to watch is cartoons on TV. Well, I don't think they have a choice, do they? And then mum and dad come down the stairs, and they are all... It's like they've all done ecstasy. They're all like, hello, Anthony! They all have to be so <laughs> Welcome! Happy. We love you! Welcome home! We've missed you so much! Who's your friend? Hello! And they're just... She's like, what the fuck is going on here? Why are they all acting so weird? Um, she says... Kevin McCarthy's the best. Uh, is that the, of the body snatchers. Yeah. He's good. Um, she says... Oh, uh, well, I, I thought I'd better come in because I actually hit him off his bike. And they all go, oh, did you? That You can tell they're all a bit like, oh, that was good because we want him to hurt, get hurt. Yeah. Um, how did, what happened? Are you all right, Anthony? Um, and they insist that she stays for dinner. Yeah, let have some dinner. Come on, it's his birthday. Oh, yeah. So he says, well, let me give you a tour of my house. And we'll go upstairs and we'll wash up for dinner. So he takes her upstairs. 
And while she while they're upstairs, they grab her handbag, don't they? Yeah. And start rummaging through it. They find some cigarettes. They smoke them. Luckily, James Woods isn't there. Otherwise, someone's getting electrocuted. They smoke her cigarettes. Um, they they find out who she is and what what she does. She's a teacher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's weird that that's all happening downstairs. She's upstairs with Anthony walking around. This crazy sort of Tim Burton style corridors and they seem to it's almost like she's in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. All the corridors seem to shrink and grow around her. And they walk into a room and there's a girl sat far away at the other end watching TV with her back to them. And she says, Hello. Hello. And the girl doesn't turn around. And he says, Oh, that's my sister. She was in an accident. She won't, she doesn't really speak. And then we see that the girl has no mouth. This bit was the bit where I turned it off. Once I got a bit further, I was like, no, I'm done. This girl has no mouth. I don't want to see any more of this film. It's freaky. Really? Very freaky. She doesn't have a mouth. She was in an accident. Anyway, they head back downstairs. And Anthony smells the cigarette smoke. He sort of glares at them all. You can see because it's still in the air. And he sort of goes... <laughs> and he looks at them. And they know they might be in trouble. Um, he glares at his sister. <clears throat> and Helen and Anthony sit down. And say, oh, let's watch some cartoons. And she's like, do you only ever watch cartoons? And he's like, yeah. And they all say, yes. Anthony watches whatever he wants. He gets whatever he wants. Don't you, Anthony? Yeah. We give you everything. And they say, why don't we have some birthday supper? It's in the oven, mother. It's in the oven where it always is. So she goes and gets the supper. And they bring out all these burgers and cakes and pizza, basically ice cream and every bit of junk food you can imagine. And it takes Helen a while to to figure out what the fuck kind of a dinner is this. But then she's like, oh, it's your birthday, of course. Sorry. I, uh... I forgot that, um, you know, you'd be eating this kind of crap on your birthday. And they're like, yes, he eats everything he wants on his birthday. Don't you, Anthony? The other, just... the other day, very much, sorry for interrupting there, uh, I gave Elijah his dinner and it was like, um, like a burger, no, like a beefsteak sort of thing. It's a Yorkshire pudding, some uh, broccoli and some uh, chips because I'd run out of potatoes. <clears throat> and uh, he put uh, Pez emptied a Pez container and put Pez on his burger and on his food in his Yorkshire pudding. And I went, yeah, go for it. I said, do you want gravy? He says, no, I'm going to have Pez. So Pez, if you don't know, obviously everyone knows Pez, little sweets. He put all sweets for his food and just ate them like that, quite happily. I've got a photo of it, since, yeah. Yeah, at, at the age of two, my kids currently are just, they don't really care what's dessert and what's mains and they just mix them together sometimes okay. sometimes sometimes we'll give like edith especially here's your, here's your yogurt or here's your jelly for dessert and she'll just start putting chips in it yeah it's like oh well you're eating it to be honest with you us adults should probably do that more really oh yeah you can sometimes mix stuff and go that's actually pretty good yeah if you ever want to taste what a child's... If you want want to remember what a child's party well, tastes sweet like... sweet meat, but that sounds wrong. That's what wrong. If you ever want a nostalgic vibe mm. and a taste of being at a children's party when you're a kid, put a, like a, a salted crisp or potato chip in your mouth and a piece of chocolate at the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That taste is it's, just... Oh, it's not too bad, actually. Reminds you of being a kid and just eating everything at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Rocking I love chocolate that. and savoury. Yeah. yeah, you're like, oh well, I'm at a party. I'm eating, I'm eating what's yeah, it, I, I, and I'm I, eating Kit Kats. I'd probably eat a chocolate sausage roll. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty man! I'm going to start that. People would fucking love it. Chocolate. They would. So you know, saturated fats would be fucking terrible. Um. So Nancy Cartwright, um, Bart Simpson complains at this point. She's got the balls to say. Have you told her it's your birthday? Not another birthday, Anthony, for God's sake. And her plate suddenly flips over on its own at this. And Helen decides at this point, I think I'm going to leave now. It's a good, it's, good, good call. Uh, however, he says, no. Anthony says, don't go. 
Uncle Walt's going to do a trick, aren't you, Uncle Walt? Oh, no. As a child, my heart started racing. When, once I got past the no mouth scene, I'm like, well, what the fuck is going to What's the trick going to be? Because there's something about this film, you know, do you want to see something scary? Uncle Walt's going to do a trick. You just think, well, what is it going to be? What's next? What's the next scene? Um, I had an Uncle Walt. Gav, yep. he, used to do, he used to do a trick. Oh, I don't want to know what he did. I'm joking. No, actually, I won't tell that story. Um, Uncle, and I'm not going to tell that story. <laughs> I don't know what every you've conjured up thoughts which people don't want to have and you don't want to tell us the story which we think it is. It's alright, don't worry about it. Um, don't speak ill of the dead. Okay. <laughs> so Uncle Walt gets his magician's top hat and he starts giving it all the sort of oh look, there's nothing in the hat. There's nothing in the hat. And they're all looking like ah, a bit scared because they've seen this trick before. And Anthony's like, Yeah, go on, Uncle Walt, do it. And he pulls a rabbit out of the hat. And she's like, wow, that's very clever. I am going to go now. He's like, wait, Uncle Walt, do more. And this time, he pulls a gigantic mutated weird rabbit creature out of the hat, which is like the Tasmanian devil. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, this is. Look what I've brought out the hat. (laughs) It's like the Tasmanian devil has had a baby with Bugs Bunny and one of the terror dogs the, the family look like they just live with anxiety 100 percent all day long 24 7 yeah like, because, just because of that kid they're serving this child's every Kids wish like carry yeah. yeah they're living in this like weird hell house that he controls everything in it's very strange um so the huge monster rabbit uh he says to it go away and it vanishes and he says to helen please don't go um she's like i'm gonna go i'm gonna go and he finds a note in her purse that one of them has written that says anthony is a monster please help us and he is so angry at this point he's like which one of you wrote this and they and blame the, blame bart simpson yeah and he says don't have a cow man yeah. i mean his sister says I caramba. Remember when Bart used to say I caramba? He doesn't say that anymore, does he? No, you don't know. You don't watch Simpsons. I used to watch it back when it was Bart Simpson, but oh. now it's all about Homer and the rest of the wherever they live. I used to love it back in the late eighties, early nineties when it was just about Bart. Well, it's I, always I, been about the Simpsons, not just Bart. I've always yeah, been called Bart. But Bart was like the main, you know, the main attraction. Well, and then over the years, yeah. Homer has turned into the main attraction. Well, yeah, but that was years ago. Yeah, yeah. I know. Right. I used to double bill it every Thursday. It used to be on, followed by the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Mm. So that's what you'd watch after school on a Thursday. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. And then Quantum Leap. It was a great day, Thursday. Yeah. Great day. Um, where are we at? Oh, yes. So, uh, because Ethel, his sister, Bart Simpson, has written this note, he banishes her to cartoon land so she goes into the tv where she is basically eaten by a big giant cartoon dragon Mm. Mm. so helen opens the door to try and get out there's a giant eyeball looking at her there like the twilight zone sort of intro and uh, he says to her i can't help it helen whatever i wish for just happens anything i want i can have the tv splits open a giant whirlwind comes out this big slimer creature Tasmanian devil thing comes out pretty good practical effects it looks a bit like one of the killer clowns from outer space I suppose yeah. um, which should have been a Joe Dante film really imagine if he'd have directed that Yeah, that would have been pretty good um, he wishes she says you need to wish it away she uses her teacher skills now I've written her teacher skills and she guides him she says wish it away and he does and he wishes it away and then she then they appear in the middle of like this just nothing and she says where are we he says we're nowhere Helen we aren't anywhere yeah it's pretty weak ended and she says you're special now this bit at the end can be interpreted in two ways she says you're special but be careful with your powers. I can help you master your powers. I can be your teacher. You can be my teacher. And he's like, all right, yeah, all right, we'll do that. Now, is that because she wants the power for herself or is it because she fears him 
and she just wants to save herself and get out of there or does she think he's some kind of like messiah some god and she can like I don't know it's not a very strong ending well they reappear they get in the car they drive off through a beautiful um, meadow with flowers blooming um, that's it yeah. what a week ending I needed more Dick Miller in that one Gav more Dick would always have benefited the picture but overall very uncomfortable viewing yeah till that ending yeah, yeah creepy was... that kid is creepy i i uh, when i'm watching this review though so far i haven't been blown away by this movie and i love some of the twilight zone episodes and some cra- cracking episodes but so far in the movie no f- the three stories it's all right but it's nothing amazing I think the first two, man, I don't even... Obviously, the Vic Murray one, I don't well, need... Well, tainted from the accident, obviously, you know. But if you didn't know that, you might enjoy the first one a bit. But the second one is just like a dip in quality. <clears throat> yeah, and then that third one there's like, it's okay. But then yeah. this one, though, is really good. It's my favourite episode. Um, I love this episode. George Miller. And William Shatner originally as John Lithgow's. Yeah, so John Lithgow, who is a fantastic actor as well. And this one is the famous Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Wow. Yeah. Great great little segment. I just want to see all of this, really, more and more of this. This is like Passenger 57, but... I, lo- I love movies set on airplanes. Yeah, yeah snakes, like snakes on a plane. Contained. Yeah. Air Force One. All that. What other ones are there? I don't know. There's fucking loads. Executive, What's that? executive decision. Oh, yeah. That's the one where Spit Seagal dies. Passenger 57. It's yeah. not very good. It's all right. Snakes on a plane. Yeah. Do you know there's a snakes on a train? There's a... There's a... <coughs> is there a Liam Neeson? There's a Liam Neeson one. It's quite good. Non-stop. That's on a plane. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, it's not too bad. There's a what, snakes on a train? Yeah, I don't know. I want to, I want John Wick to just one John Wick film to just be him on a plane. Yeah, that would be quite good because I'm totally bored of John Wick movies and I. Uh, I, I haven't seen the newest one. I I, I started yeah. watching it and then realised I'd seen it, <laughs> so I turned it off. Okay. And I was like, I couldn't even remember watching it. I will well, 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 watch nonsense. it. I'll watch it at some point. Really enjoyed the first one. And second, yeah, both went to cinema for the second one. So, Nightmare on 20,000 Feet. So, we see a plane flying along at night as well, in a storm. So, it's not great. It's straight up my alley, this one is. Hello. <laughs> and isn't isn't Holly on this plane? John McClane isn't waiting for it at the hotel. We've got John Valentine played by John Lithgow, and he's having a panic attack in the bathroom on the plane. Clearly, this man doesn't like flying, Gav. Yeah. Have you ever witnessed anybody um, go crazy on a plane before? No, um, but at some point, uh, uh, Sarah... (laughs) uh, Just uh, Sarah's never been on a plane due to different reasons. And uh, at some point, I'm going to take her on a plane and uh, hoping she's not going to freak the fuck out. But I'm almost expecting John Lifka, though. I saw a guy freak out <clears throat> when I was flying back from Canada on my own. It was only one of, it was one of the first sort of four or five flights I'd ever done. And I'd been to Hong Kong and back on my own, and I went to Canada and back on my own. And on my way back from Canada, I, I could hear over the music on my headphones some shouting and alerts and some guy was absolutely losing it because there was really bad turbulence and it kept doing that thing where the plane sort of dropped and you'd feel your stomach mm. go up a bit and um he was sort of shouting out there's something wrong there's something wrong with this plane i'm telling you and they were trying to calm him down and he was starting to freak out some of the other passengers and he, i think he ended up having a bit of a panic attack so they took him off to the you know the bit where near the toilets where you can't be seen they shut the curtains they calmed him down in the end they probably gave him some booze or something but um god he was really freaking out and i remember thinking this is way before final destination i remember thinking what if he's right this is a bit weird but it it didn't last long it was only for a few minutes but yeah yes 
but yeah john valentine is in this bathroom and the staff are knocking on the door and he just won't come out he takes a pill he's obviously got these pills to help him with his panic panic attacks they manage to help him back to his seat he is a sweaty nervous mess isn't he he is definitely not in a good place they dump him in his seat like he dump a there's lightning going on it's it's such a great setting it really is and uh, it turns out he's an author because they they say oh why don't you read your book um who wrote this and he's like me (laughs) and he says can i leave the light on yes okay you'll be fine sir honestly but you must fasten your seatbelt we've got really bad turbulence you know i'm going to tell you that so he lights a cigarette which i'm guessing was okay back then on a plane yeah 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 great James Woods would have loved that. Yep. His wife wouldn't. Um, but he starts, whether he's hallucinating or not, he looks around at this creepy fucking kid with a ventriloquist doll <coughs> who says, you shouldn't smoke on the tra- on the plane, buddy. Yeah. It's not good for you. So he thinks, oh, fuck, I'm losing it here. So he puts the cigarette out. A big fat guy in front of him turns around at him as well. So he thinks, oh, I'll just take some more pills. More in these pills. Fil- in these films, when these guys have got pills for their like condition or their whatever it is, they always take like handfuls of them at a time, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently, and, and as soon as they take them, they work straight away. Straight away. It's always literally it's, it's, it works. If you look at this, like in real life, it's like take four of these per day, like four hours between each one. It, on these films, it must just say, grab a handful of between 10 and 20, me, shovel them into your fine. mouth, Firm, you'll be fine done. in seconds. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so he, they're going along, the lightning is still striking and that, but he looks out of his window and he thinks he sees something. It's very creepily done. If you didn't know the original story... Um, the uh, TV episode you'd be like did I see something out there I'm not quite sure and he looks at a few times and he eventually figures out it looks like a man on the wing so he tells the he tells the um, air staff you know there's I think there's a man on the wing of the plane and they're like sir please I don't think there is so they look outside there's nothing out there no of course he calms down a little bit he takes some more pills. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, yeah. Just a perfect solution. Take, take some more Even pills. the airlines uh, lady says to him, I'm not really supposed to do this, sir, but I do have some sleeping tablets, some sedatives that I can give you a couple of if you want. Well, they, it's like, t- they just want him to chill the fuck out. I don't care, you know. I, d- I can't just inject this heroin into you, sir. You'll be absolutely fine. Now, she says to him, you know, try and get some sleep. So he does. He, he sort of lies back a bit. Then he peeks out the window again. And this time, there's this fucking face up against the glass. Jesus Christ, Gav. It's great. It's really good effects. I like it. It's it Also, you don't expect it to be there that soon. You might you think you might see it crawling in the distance again. Yeah. But it's right there up against the glass. I like that choice. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a short film. Get to it, you know. George Miller, man. Um, so he screams. Obviously, the passengers all start to be coming panicked and concerned now. But the captain he gets now comes over, and so he asks the captain to look out. Just will you please just look out there, you know? Yeah, and there's obviously there's nothing when he looks, and there's also a sky marshal there who says, "Look, I've got handcuffs. I can handcuff him if you want. I've got a gun. I'm a sky marshal." Um, but now everyone gets calmed down. Um, he does, you know, he gets threatened with the handcuffs before calming down. He rants again. He says to the captain, one of the engines is out. And he says, all right, listen, sir, between you and I, you're right. One of the engines is out. But this is whatever plane it is, a Boeing or whatever it is. And it's got four engines. One of them's out. It's very common for one engine to go on a big plane like this during a storm. We're still going to fly. We're still going to land. It's all going to be fine. But I can't have the other passengers knowing about the engine. So I need you to calm down. So he's right. One of the engines is out. But he's seen something tearing at the engine outside. This thing that was up against the glass. And he says, incidentally, how do you know about that? And he says, well, I saw something. Something out there was ripping at it. Doesn't believe him. But, but how does he know? So he should, like, you know, but... 
I guess there couldn't be anything out there that's been logical, I suppose. More terrible turbulence happens. We see some of the passengers are praying now. It's a really good fast moving camera work, but I guess, you know, in a confined director. Yeah, yeah. It's in good. a confined space. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, that sort of direction it went to Mad Max Fury Road. You know? I was going to say that fast moving camera zooming along people. Oh, that it's film's got, it's got two, two more Mad Maxes coming out. That have you seen the trailer for Furiosa? Uh, I think so. Which is the younger Charlize Theron character, Furiosa? Um, it looks incredible, and it's it's Liam Hemsworth. Thor is the baddie in it, and there's def he's definitely channeling Mel Gibson in it because he's not playing a Mel Gibson character. But you know when Mel Gibson gets a bit crazy in movies, like Riggs, there's a scene at the end of the trailer where he Liam Hemsworth sort of shouts something. And you think, bloody hell, that could have been... Because he's got the Australian accent. You think, bloody hell, that could have been Mel Gibson then. Mm. It doesn't look anything like Liam Hemsworth either. He's got like a prosthetic nose and stuff. But anyway, back to this. Yeah, great camera angles and stuff like that. Passengers are now praying. They're concerned. This guy's kicking off. He's been threatened with handcuffs. He's told everybody he's seen something on the wing. But also, they are experiencing this awful turbulence. So it's not a great, pleasant flight for a lot of people. Um, he sees the creature trashing the wing now. It, suddenly it starts a fire, so he grabs a camera and he thinks, I'll take a picture of this with my Polaroid camera. But of course, the reflection of the flash on the glass, we all know nothing comes out if you do that. Silly. He tries to break the window with a fire extinguisher. No. That's the last stroke. It's not, yeah, you can't do that. So the, the sky marshal comes flying over, and there is a tussle. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a tussle. Uh, he grabs the gun from the sky marshal. He shoots the window out. Yep. He starts hanging out the window and shooting at the creature. <laughs> the cabin's depressurizing. The passengers are all going crazy. The gremlin runs. Oh, this is terrifying. Runs over to him. This big gremlin creature i'm not talking little gremlins it, from it's so good this is why this is the best episode it really is it grabs the gun doesn't it and destroys it with one hand yeah and then possibly the most terrifying thing it does is it holds up one finger and just goes eh, eh, eh. Yeah. and you're like this thing is just playing that with thing it. is uh, there to kill those people and destroy them awful um but it then, weirdly, it flies off into the sky to go and destroy whatever it's supposed to do next. And they do manage to land the plane just about, even though he's depressurized the entire cabin and they've only got three of, out of four engines. Thankfully, they land the plane. And we're sort of mixing this into our epilogue now because they put him on a, a stretcher and they're about to put him in an ambulance and they're all discussing the incident how did he go? He had a gun. He must have been a terrorist. And the Sky Marshal says, no, 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 it was my gun. He took it from me. I think it was just a guy on the brink, man. It's all good. Is the plane okay? Yeah, I think we lost an engine, though. And then they look up, and there's a guy on the wing saying, you guys got to see this. And there's like Wolverine, Freddy Krueger, claw marks all over the wing where something's been clawing and ripping but at he it. He was right. He was right all along. I mean, that captain of the ship that night, that night at bed when he's going to sleep is going to be like, he was right. He was right all along. All along. So they put him in an ambulance, poor old uh, John Lithgow. And, uh, who's, the, the, who's, the pass who's the driver? Ray Stance. Yeah. Dan Aykroyd. He's, hey, buddy, how you doing? Rough, rough flight, huh? Yep. Mind if I put on a bit of music? Is that okay? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> He puts on a bit of the old, uh, it's the midnight special, on me. shine your light on me. And then he says, hey, you want to see something really scary? And then the end speech kicks in, which is, you've just experienced da -da 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 -da, and all the other stuff. And that's the end. So it, we end on a high. You we do, do end, end on a high, and you started off with, do you want to see something scary? And no, that's the best bit. So cut out the other three segments. <laughs> I know what you mean. I would. I keep the Joe Dante one. Yeah, Joe Dante's fun, I guess. Maybe just those couple then. But imagine um, <clears throat> these would have been worked better had they been 
you're exactly right. Had they been cut up into their actual segments, and I tell you what, Masters of Horror, a show like that, um, would have done. They would have done really well, well on that. People would have thought, "Oh, did you see the Joe Dante episode of Masters of Horror? You know, but did the, you see George Miller?" But this was filmed and aimed at going on a cinema and making a lot of money. Yeah, and it did make money. It but did they, I still money. feel that of respect. Oh, I don't know though. It's one of those hard. If they do cut out that first segment, you've only got those three segments, and that's that first one, the Spielberg one. It's just could be, you could be watching it going, you know. It'd be quite a short film as well, wouldn't it? Um, it would. That's the problem. So they had to keep it for these reasons. And but 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 imagine if they'd have got rid of the John Landis segment and Spielberg could then puff up his segment a little bit and make it a little bit better and then they brought in another director maybe if they did that and Spielberg said look I'll have to extend it a bit yeah make your story a bit longer so we can feel the characters more have it as the middle story imagine if they had a big meeting this is just first this is me fantasizing now but Joe John Landis's segment's gone they have a big meeting and they say look we've We've got John Carpenter. He says he he wants to do a segment for this movie, or George Romero. George you know, Romero is more like it after the Night Sound Like Creep show, just not that, that long before. Just throw an extra segment in by somebody else. Puff out the Creep, George Romero would have been perfect. Make the Spielberg section a bit better. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually prefer Cat's Eye. Spielberg's almost an odd one out to be honest with those yeah he really is uh, you know he, he touched on he, horror he's by he's too big but he's too epic he be, he was obviously Jules he was involved heavily in Poltergeist he did even E.T.'s got some horrific parts well, to it's it it's not the horror side of it it's just that he's a different type of filmmaker to these yeah. guys yeah he's not okay I guess he his first own, couple of movies for Gorilla but thing though isn't he is, you know it's not many people like him he's the best mm. He's the best storyteller. Yeah. Uh, with, with regards to a director. Uh, uh, but I just don't feel like he worked well with the short form on this film. Anyway. His, it felt to me like his heart wasn't in it yeah, for uh, obvious uh, reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, anyway, look. I prefer Cat's Eye overall, but this is still a must watch if you've oh, really? never seen it. I, I yeah, pre- yeah, I do. I prefer this, only be- but only that end story again. If you've not seen it, you uh, probably yeah, should let, watch it, but just but watch me, the end one. Let me explain why, though, because Cat's Eye, I can watch from beginning to end, um, and each segment is short and snappy enough. This is four segments that two of them I could kind of do without a little bit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So in its entirety, I prefer Cat's Eye. Yeah, I guess. Do you Put these in order, then, these four stories from bottom to top for me. Your uh, opinion? Um, Spielberg bottom, same, same Spielberg with me. Spielberg bottom, um, then I guess it's going to have to... Be, I, I don't know, actually. I guess it would possibly be taking out the respect thing, because I really wish the other one was taken out of that respect, but taken out away, I'm going to then go a thing with Jiggy, uh, Joe Dante, and then I'll go the Nazi one. Wow, OK. And then I'll go, uh, <clears throat> obviously... I'd Jim switch... Effect. I'd switch. I'm the same as you, but I'd switch the middle two round. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I, 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 there's something unsettling about that Joe Dante one well, enough for I, me. I that... do like the idea of John Landis's one, the, the the like trying to tell the racist and like this is what you get. So I, I like the, the something there. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know. It's, isn't it ironic? He was trying to tell a story about having good morals, yeah. and and ended and up being an absolute right dick. Yeah. And, and treating people how ironic with, I've just realised that respect. how strange um, but if you've never seen Twilight Zone the movie um, it's definitely worth a watch but be warned the first two segments are a bit meh but it's worth sticking around for the yeah. final two Yeah. and that opening and final scene tie all together so well Dan Aykroyd you can't go wrong with a cameo from Dan Aykroyd you can't go wrong with a cameo from Dick Miller um it is the better, well, more well-made film, but I prefer a Cat's Eye. But it is a thumbs up from me, and I'm assuming a thumbs up from you for the most part. Uh, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, just a shame. Shame it's got that um, thing attached to it of the the incident. But there we go. 
anthologies. We may come back to anthologies someday. There's a lot of good British ones from Amicus and some other studios, um, which we may cover at some point in the future. Quite, this is our American anthology. Um, I might do a get us a little British one. What do you think? Yeah, you could do. do. There's that. a few, some old school ones as well. Yeah. Tales of the Crypt and shit like that. Yeah, so we'll have a look at that. But yeah, there we go. I enjoyed talking about these with you, Gavin. Thank you so much. Um, That's fine. I think it's probably time that we vanish and come back for our, our outro so we can say our goodbyes. Let's do it. And we're back. We are back to say goodbye. Back to say goodbye. Um, well, there we go. That was our anthology special. Enjoyed doing that. Love. I love horror anthologies. I've always loved, the, like you said earlier, I think you summed it up with some of them, like particularly like the VHS ones and some of the newer ones. It is a bit hit and miss, isn't it? But the good thing about them is, you know, they're only going to be a short story. Let's move on to the next one. And you, you do usually get a couple of good ones in each anthology. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there we go. So that was episode 145. That means our next episode is doubly special because not only is it our annual Christmas special where we're going to be discussing uh, the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation from 1989, but it's also, Gav, our 10 years anniversary, How which is which is crazy. Um, that we've been doing this for a decade. Uh-huh. We've come a long way, um, and we've covered a lot of films. So, looking forward to that, guys. If you've got to this point, this is my reminder to get any messages or anything you want read out to me as soon as you can, or to us. Um, you can email the podcast on haunted at outlook dot com. You can message me on Facebook. You can just drop us a line anywhere really you want to, um, and we will include that. Even if it's a voice clip or anything, really, we'll get it included in the show. Um, but yeah, so that will be National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and we'll be discussing what it's like being a podcaster for the last ten years, some of our favourite moments, and just a few sort of highlights and silly things that have happened throughout the years, really, because it's been a long time. After yeah. that, though, our first episode of 2024, which sounds like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, um, way off in the future, um, is going to be a patron pick, and it's Matthew Godley. Patron, patron, patron. Patron, p- 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 I've, pick. I've still gone pick, pick, pick. It somewhere. Uh, so, Matthew Godley, the man that started it all, the man that came up with the concept for patron pick, he has picked and selected great way to kick off the new year with flash gordon from 1980 flash oh is there every one of us and he's paired it up with his slightly different dead man's shoes from 2004 wow yeah we're gonna have one side very light and bright and airy fairy and fluffy and the other side it's gonna get dark guys so stick with us dead man's shoes is great and then after that, Gav, it's your birthday it's episode. It's my birthday. And you've selected. Why don't you tell us what you've selected? Uh, I have indeed selected two films of different varying degrees, that's for sure. Sorcerer, William Friedkin Sorcerer from 70-something. Transporting liquid nitrogen in a Jeep across the desert. Is that right? Yep. That's, Can't wait. That's the film. That's basically the plot of the film. Yep, never seen it. So, um, and then the other one, Studio Six Six Six, just because I um, I went to the cinema to watch it, and I really enjoyed it as a. They know exactly what film they're making, and it's a band making a film. And Dave Dave Grohl is actually pretty perfect as this role, and it's great. And John Carpenter's in it. Yep. He, he has a little cameo as a producer. Um, and it just it feels like an, a perfect 80s horror movie like you'd find back in the day in the video shop and I've never seen that one either so it's going to be almost like an Italian one but it's set in America or something 
I was going to watch it when it hit Netflix in the UK a couple of weeks ago, but I'm going to hold off on yeah, watching it now do. until then because um, I want to go into both of those fresh. It's just really enjoyable movie, and I was just really surprised. It's uh, better than like some horror movies out there which uh, try and do that thing, try and be 80s. They're, they're, these, <clears> these guys just do it really well, and I'm just like, where's this come from? When did you, <laughs> you all just sit around and go... Do you know what we should do? We're a band, but let's make a horror movie, which is like an 80s horror movie. They obviously love that sort of era of horror well, movies. It's definitely a pat on the back to them if John Carpenter liked it enough to be in it, because he does not come out of his cupboard very often these days. Uh, yeah, I, he, <coughs> mm, I don't want to say it, wrote some music for it, but I'm not sure. Okay. But anyway, um, it's an enjoyable film. Uh, there's a lot of gore in it as well. So that'll be episode 148, Gav's birthday special. Well, proper gore as well. It's like you kind of very 80s horror movie. Yeah, extreme. So, so those three episodes will take us up to the end of January. So that's um, Christmas, patron pick, and a birthday episode. So nice way to start off the year. And don't forget, any episode that isn't a birthday or um, you know a, uh, a franchise special or a patron pick for 2024, because it is our 10th year, it will be a director special, so you're going to get a good half dozen or more director specials throughout 2024, which will be fun as well. Um, right, let me do some admin. Let me say the admin, and then we can say our goodbyes, Gavin. Yep. Okay, so as always, we are the podcast on Haunted Hill, a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, and we have been for 10 bloody years. I know. That's crazy. Um, you can find out more about Legion if you go to legionpodcast.com. That's where us and all the other shows under the network are available. Um, also on Facebook, Legion Podcasts have a Facebook page, as do we, the podcast on Haunted Hill. We built up a community. I had somebody say to me that they should be really proud of the community that you've built and i thought that's so touching of someone to say but they said you should be proud it's a really lovely community you've built and i've made some genuine friends we built this community <laughs> on uh, horror, horror films, films. <laughs> we've known each other way too long um but we have and we've got some great friends in there and you guys can join it too it is now a private group but as long as you're not a bot i can allow you to join the group or a dick or a yeah, or a dick. We don't really have any dicks. We only ever had one dick, and we got rid of him. Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, yeah, so go to Facebook, search for Legion, search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. You can contact me on Facebook. You can contact me on, or us, on the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com. Um, and we're available wherever you're listening to us now, Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, Podcast Addicts, and any other good any other good place you can listen to podcasts. Um, we are also on Instagram which is just somewhere I really basically promote the show, uh, the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. Uh, you heard us mention Sanctuary Moon a couple of times, our Star Wars horror film that we made, short film. Um, we did that through our production company, Deadbolt Films. We have a website, which is deadboltfilms.com. And more importantly, we have a web, um, a YouTube channel, Deadbolt Films. Uh, we're also on Instagram under Deadbolt Films. So, yeah, go there, Dude, check, check out, out Sanctuary Moon. Yep. We're just coming up on 32,000 views now which we're very proud of um it has its peaks and troughs some days you get thousands of views other days it slows down but people are watching it and we're getting lots of good comments on it and we're extremely proud of it yep and finally um we are also uh, on patreon so if you want to essentially sponsor the show and uh, donate some money and help us make the show grow and continue to grow and keep it ticking over for as little as a pound a month or as much as you want it really is up to you we would do this as always we would do this for free but the fact that we have people helping us out through patreon means that we can buy equipment headphones mics and other large pieces of equipment sometimes we can also just rent or buy more obscure films to, to review and watch um it really does help yes thank you very much <clears throat> yeah we're really really thankful to our patrons uh, i'm not sure how long we've had patron now probably five Quite, years yeah, probably uh, yeah so thank you so much for coming yeah. on yeah thank you guys um if you become a patron there are perks obviously you will get a call out at the end of each show which i'll do in a moment you will get a t-shirt in one of three colors um sent to you directly and you get to participate in the patron picks um so you'll get to pick two movies that can be horror horror adjacent cult sci-fi as long as they're in that kind of vein yep. we will cover them um tell us why you love them tell us 
your favourite bits about them, how you first watched them, whatever you want to do, and we'll read all of that out, and you get to wear the crown and be the king and or queen of that episode. Um, and that's every three episodes of Patreon Pick. If you want to become a patron, just go to Patreon and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. <clears throat> if you can't find it, email me on that email address, the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com, or message me and I'll point you in the right direction. You don't have to do it, but if you want to, we will love you for it. Yes, we will. As always, thank you to our patrons who I will now thank in a series of voices, probably just going to be normal voices, I think, this time, Gav. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. <clears throat> Let's just do normal voices. So thank you very much to Don Collier. Thanks, dude. Don, we did get your um, message or email. I'm going to reply to you, your email, actually. Um, but I just wanted to let you know I did get it. And yes, we got everything that you sent us. So thank you very much. Thank you also to Matthew Godley. Thank you. Matthew, thank you for sending me that DVD. Um, you're a legend. Appreciate that. And thanks for setting up the whole page or suggesting the whole page and thing. Um, thank you to Jamie Jenkins. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie, you, you've you been here from the beginning. Thank you so much. What can I say? <laughs> Is this like a reward ceremony? <laughs> but she has. and She's always been supportive. Come up, get, um, it, come up, get your reward. Thank you to Kevin S. Fife as well. You've Thanks, been Kev. a long-time listener as well. Sarah Kay. Thanks, Sarah. You've been there from the beginning. Rachel, you're a real-life friend as well as a, a patron supporter. We love you loads. Cheers, Rach. RJ, you've become pretty much a best friend of ours. We love you to bits. Thanks, thank RJ. you so much, RJ McCready. And Lex Boo, thank you so, so much for all your support over the years. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. You guys are all awesome. We love you all so much. We cannot say that.